Welcome to our backyard. This is the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We are two friends having a discussion after everyone else has passed out or gone to bed. Grab a drink and listen as we discuss everything from automation, space exploration, and why the meaning of life is 42. Would you rather live in the cold, desolate, barren Mars or California? That's right. We're going to Mars. Mike, how you doing? What are you drinking? I'm doing fantastic. i am been looking forward to this conversation for a while. We finally get to go back into space, but I feel like you're going to bring it back to plants, Nick. That's right. We're going to talk about plants later, and Mike was sitting here all ready to talk about fun stuff like rocket science and rocket surgery and all this cool rockets and shit like that. Nope. We're going to talk about plants and why we need plants to survive. But first, let's talk about getting off the earth. Wait, first we got to talk about what are you drinking? I am having gin and juice. And I love how you think about getting off the planet. It's all about rockets. (laughs) Living on Mars, just rockets, more rockets. What about you, Nick? What are you drinking? I, uh, in the spirit of becoming a multi-planet species, I was like, you know what? Step out of the comfort zone. Let's, uh... Let's do something different. And so I purchased a Japanese whiskey called Sensei. And it's uh, it's not as bad as I thought. I mean, not as good as American whiskey, obviously, but, you know, that's a hard, hard competition. Hey, you're getting out of your comfort zone. I always applause that. But you brought it up. Leaving Earth. We want to all go to Mars. We all want to go to Europa. We all want to go to Venus. But we got to get off Earth first. So how do we do that? Well, there's a few ways. One, as Nick likes to bring it up rockets lots and lots of rockets we can use propellant and we have been using propellants to simply get off the earth just use enough velocity to get off the planet now to figure out well not to figure out but to tell everyone how much velocity actually takes it takes about eleven thousand milliseconds to get off the ground velocity and for nick that's about twenty five thousand miles per hour just to help you out there nick Yeah, it's still not really something I can comprehend, but go on. (laughs) Metric's so much better. Learn metric, goddammit. Then we have another one, which I thought I was being quite original with my idea, but apparently we thought about it for a while. It's using railguns. Now, Nick, do you know what a railgun is? From Halo, yes. Okay. Do you know the science behind it? Use magnets to propel something? Yeah, pretty much. For those who don't know, uh, a railgun is pretty much taking electromagnets and usually capacitors need to discharge energy quite quickly and you're usually sending a non-ferric metal like aluminum and it is a target and those electromagnets create a field that launches and pushes you give a quick shout out to bungee for that one (laughs) there's also space elevators which has been in science fiction for ever brad pitt just came out with a movie about space elevators and then there's laser explosions using lasers to burn material to project a rocket or a space shuttle upward. Now, I want to go a little bit more in depth on each of them because they all have their benefits and they all have their issues. One, let's start with rockets. Everyone, good old-fashioned, got to the moon rockets. They work, but they're not 100% renewable, granted with innovators like Elon Musk and, and other innovators are creating rockets that can be reused, but not everything is renewable. So a big part is the fuel source. Rockets need a lot of fuel to get off that 11,000 millimeters per second. Sorry. And with that comes a lot of high cost. Not to mention all the greenhouse gases of burning the hydrogen and oxygen together because they're usually liquid that they pump into, which also kind of makes it a little bit dangerous and sometimes they explode. They've had it in the past. Now, railguns, which... I thought I was being bloody clever using real guns. There's a small problem, Nick. Do you happen to know what that problem is? Does that have something to do with how fast we would be accelerated? You hit the nail on the head, my friend. Uh, apparent, a problem is using a rail electric magnetic system to get us into space has the problem of turning any living organism into pink mist. So that's a bit of an issue. Now you might ask, why don't we just make it longer? Well, we thought about that, and in order to make it the proper length in a linear line, 
you're pretty much in the space outer space already. You pretty just made a ramp to space. I thought, why don't we just do it into a circle, kind of like a certain rider where they just kept spinning it around and around and around. I haven't seen that enter idea entertained at all, but we'll get to that in a bit. Then there's uh, lasers, which... Wait, before you move on, and I don't know if you're going to touch on this, can we use a railgun to put equipment and non-organic material in this space yes actually we've done it uh in small experiments at different universities and different organizations it's worked quite well for that they haven't launched anything into space they may launch something small into the outer atmosphere but i'm not quite sure the distance of it but we can do it for non-living matter but it tends to turn humans into pink mist which i find hilarious and also scary at the same time <laughs> then going to lasers i do love lasers and there's a new technology yeah, can we get them on some freaking dolphins <laughs> well actually that's another whole conversation we have put lasers on dolphins nick i'll tell you about that afterwards but laser lift a whole technology you keep saying the word laser but i don't hear the air quotes nope it's not an air quote it's <laughs> it's actually a laser lasers like that <laughs> you will pay us one minute Millions not out anymore. One billion dollars. No, but laser lift, a technology I did not know exist, and it's your kind of normal rocket that we're all familiar with, but less fuel and different materials. So I, this is very simplified version of it, but I think it's the best way to explain it. You launch a rocket upward. You kind of just launch it in the air, and the outside of the hull, you have a material that when superheated creates a explosive gas which keeps propelling it upward so pretty much your fuel is different it's actually the material itself and instead of ignition source you're using lasers on the ground to light it and get it off kind of like a continuous explosion going all the way up it'd be good a lot more cost effective than traditional rockets less fuel needed less uh less weight but i don't quite know enough about this technology and the idea of shooting explosive material on a space shuttle with lasers yeah i don't think i'd explain that one of why that might be dangerous now space elevators from conspiracy theorists to science fiction authors everyone loves the idea of space elevator why don't we just build this tall enough structure to get all the way up it's a good idea but one i don't think any of us will live to be able to see it two it's a lot easier said than done and three, just a small problem, there might be no material in the known universe capable of handling that much stress and weight needed to do this. So elevator kind of is out the window unless we find a new super material that we don't know about. Isn't this, weren't people really excited? They were thinking carbon nanotubes, we we're going to be able to use them to make the elevator and then it also wasn't going to happen yeah carbon nanotubes aren't strong enough to do that i tell you folks uh, i've worked with car uh, carbon nanotubes they are uh maybe maybe carbon nanotubes mixed in with metal foam because metal foam's super strong pretty light because it's got air pockets but that yeah i you gotta understand this is going up thousands of miles wind it's got to rotate with the earth it's a lot different temperatures storms that's there's so much. It's kind of like like a slinky, right? Like it's being pulled by the Earth's gravity, and it's also being pulled by outer space. So it's or by the like it's being swung around really fast. So it's got two forces pulling on it all the time. Yeah, and I'll, I also think about a tape measure. We've all played with tape measures when we were kids. The longer, yeah, everyone's trying to you know get tape measure out really long, but still keep it firm and uh, and stiff, so you could play around with it, but. If you get the wrong angle or you go too far, it cracks underneath the pressure and falls apart. It seems to be the way with a space elevator. But let's say we leave the Earth and we forget about the small problem of overcoming Earth gravity. <laughs> Bye, California. <laughs> uh, I think <laughs> I think everyone wants to do that. But now how do we travel to other planets and moons? Well, there's hope. There is the ion propulsion. Nick, do you know anything about iron ion propulsion? Nope. Okay. Then I'm going to simplify it real fast for everyone and yourself included. For those who don't know what ion propulsion is, it's basically uh, using electricity to energize particles, creating positive ions. For those who don't remember, in chemistry class, uh, ions are just, you know, 
different particles charges and they either you know increase electrons decrease protons you know positively charged negatively charged etc etc and they through electromagnets pretty much shoot out those those ions to create propulsion it's sending it's like sending a bunch of atoms well it's not atoms it's actually ion but just for explaining purposes you're sending a bunch of atoms out the back of a shuttle to create thrust and it could be quite beneficial because we could figure out how to do with hydrogen so we could refill in space because space is abundant with hydrogen and just for a fun fact once we leave earth gravity we are gonna have to travel 34 ish million miles away which is and that's when mars is at its closest to earth so we have a big 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 difference of land to cover we could do something very similar to what the expanse does great tv show highly recommend we could do with normal rockets that we have today once we get into space we put the pedal to the metal we just burn as much fuel as we can until we get about halfway to our trip then we turn the ship around and keep pressing on the gas pedal so it slowly descends our slowly lowers our speed because you have to remember there's no wind resistance in space it's a vacuum so if you're traveling at one meter per second, it'll keep increasing. So it, it, it adds on to each other. So once we get about halfway, we have to turn around and slow ourselves down, which is very good. And then another one, which seems out of science fiction, is possible, but also might be the most dangerous. We could set up accelerating space rings. It's, we could make, I don't know, the uh, space station out of aluminum, and we could use like the eddy current magnet effect to keep getting boosts. So you get to space, you don't have any more fuel. Okay, this this just sounds like you've been playing Star Fox. No, no, I swear, I can I can do the math behind it. I swear, I can prove it. It's it, but you pretty much just have a non ferric material. Well, we could use ferric material if you change out from the eddy current magnet. But right, anyhow, pretty much couple couple rings set and cut throughout space, and every time you go through it, you get like a little boost, a little kicker, a little slingshot effect. And it would be effective. The only problem is you got to deal with asteroids hitting those rings, maintenance, the possible, well, rogue planets won't really come into our solar system. We that we might touch on rogue planets later, but not quite sure. And then last one, which we've sort of done in history, which is solar sails. It's being a pirate in space. And yes, Nick, you can become the first space pirate. No one's been in there yet. It's setting up solar winds and catching them. It's catching the rays of the sun to sail you to your destination using that energy of sunlight to propel you forward. I'm trying to think of a good space pirate name if I can't grow facial hair. Well, either way, my uh, my spaceship will in fact be named The Satisfaction. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Touche. Touche. But Nick, you might ask yourself, all right, we have the methods to get off the earth. We have the methods to travel to another planet, but it takes time to get to Europa on Jupiter venus or mars and that time could mean bad things for our pink meat sacks of bodies main one being gravity gravity currently on the international space station is being combated against with machinery called ired and ared well ired is the new iteration of ared but it pretty much stands for interim resistance exercise device so they use exercises in microgravity situations like on the international space station such as squats, deadlifts, running, rows, curls, benching, on this very cool machine. And it's all using resistance to, to utilize in order to create work so that the astronauts can stay fit. Actually, uh, one of the twins who recently went to space for a year said most astronauts actually return fitter from the International Space Station than they left. That's because you have to work out a lot on the international space station and we're gonna have to work out a lot once we get to those planets with gravity and just some numbers out there mars has about 40 percent of earth's gravity venus has about 90 percent of earth's gravity and europa has about 14 percent of earth's gravity and this is a very major concern because muscle atrophy bone loss is huge astronauts in space can lose up to 20 percent of their muscle mass in just two weeks in a microgravity situation if you don't use it you lose it. We've all been there where we made gains from going to the gym, took a couple weeks off, and we lost them all. It's accelerated in space. But to me, muscle mass is the easiest to combat. You can just work out. And some astronauts have even worked out seven hours in a day. But the one that's concerning me the most is bone 
But weakening of bones and organs is a whole list of problems. We don't think about it, but our bodies are naturally built to take on 1G, Earth's gravity, 9 point, was it, 81 meters per second with 32.2 feet per second. Now, exercise... Yeah, I actually knew that. Look at that. Hey! Exercise and nutrition is how we are combating the weaker gravity and negative effects on our body. You'll need to work out consistently and thoroughly in space, but for long travel, once we get that propellant, like we mentioned, you know, sun, uh, solar sails or space rings, we might be able to use a centrifugal force to simulate gravity. Basically, our celestial transport ships would be spinning rings or spinning ships. If these spinning ships, you have will have no idea that they're actually spinning because there's no up or down, left or right in space. It's just all per your perspective. But that spinning force would cause centrifugal force, which in our bodies would simulate gravity. We would have a force pulling us outward because that's what happens when you spin a ball on a rope. It's that force going outward, so that would pull us down outwards towards where we're spinning so our bodies don't atrophy to no gravity. We could use magnets or suction shoes to help combat gravity deficiency. Electromagnets in our shoes to help us keep it planned on the floor, similar to the shoes in the book's last TV show, The Show Expanse. I love that show, so I might bring it up a few times. So I never, I watched the show, but I never really thought about it. So the magnets can provide resistance when you try to pick your feet up, almost like an artificial gravity. Is that what you're getting at? Yes. Well, the magnets are help pulling you down. The only problem with that is it's not pulling your entire body down. So when you're spinning really fast, it's an entire... Like if you've ever been in a carnival and you're like in a teacup and you feel that force pulling you to the outside of the the cup or whatever ride you're on, that centrifugal force. With magnet shoes, it'd be resistance, but it wouldn't be universal on your body. It would mainly just be your legs and yeah, maybe your core. Uh, you wouldn't get it anywhere in your upper body or skull or any your spine. It just it'd mainly just be your legs. But I guess something's better than nothing. Oh, you could never skip leg day in space. <laughs> no, quite the opposite. You can never skip arm day in space if you have magnet shoes. Wouldn't it be you could always skip <laughs> arm day? No, because you 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 won't have any resistance on your arms, so you start losing losing muscle mass and uh, bone density. Yeah, so I guess then it's skip arm day and die <laughs> yeah if you want if you want small tiny worthless arms we could also i'm not quite sure how this would work but we could use a compressive suit almost like a exoskeleton suit that's crushing you you pretty much like have like resistant bands that loop around from your ankle like the bottom of your feet to your shoulder so you're always being kind of squished so you have to resist it it's not the best idea it'd be like i guess the best way to say it is like nick are you familiar with g suits for pilots no, it's just kind of reminding me of like a wetsuit or a, like a dry suit where you have just kind of tight all over. Yeah, it'd be like that. Well, for those who don't know, a, G, a G-force a suit for pilots, it is mechanically controlled to help squeeze parts of your body to help push blood back to your brain so you stay conscious. It'd be a similar effect to that. It would squish your body so you have to resist it in order to function. It's not the best idea, but if we're just throwing out any ideas out there, I'll throw it out gravitons if gravitons are real and for those who don't know gravitons are a theoretical particle that carry gravitational force if they're real and we can prove their existence and we can harness and use them we could just make artificial gravity planet salt well that just seems like the easiest option but that's all right nick uh how about you go find us some gravitons and uh well yeah gravitons would be great nick just uh take a shovel and go find them out but that's this is all gravity in outer space Once we get to another planet, that's a whole nother thing. Because being on a planet or another moon, gravity will be so different. Like those numbers I mentioned earlier. Anywhere from 90% ours to 14% of ours. And again, exercise and diet will be the keystone. But long exposure to more or less gravity will change us. Making it harder or impossible to return to Earth because our bodies have changed so much. Born on another celestial body or in space may mean you can never visit Earth, simply because your body's not be able to survive. Now, we could genetically alter or engineer to survive on our bodies to keep going in between planets and moons, but there's a lot of ethics about that, which we'll talk about in later. But Nick, I've been kind of rambling on. We covered how to get out of, sp- out of Earth, how to travel through the stars, how to combat the gravity once we're traveling, but say now we land there. What are you first doing, Nick? 
part of the Pilgrims' first deal when they get to the United States, my, well, I guess North America at that point. You got to grow food. Food. Oh, boy. I can feel, I, can, I feel like poison ivy's in the room. I can just feel the vines and plants growing around me. I bet you thought we were going to go this entire Mars talk and not discuss trees. <laughs> I was hoping so, but I know better at this point. <laughs> so humans, unfortunately, need to eat. It's one of the biggest problems of sending people into outer space and anywhere. I mean, logistically, even sending an army into another country. You got to feed those guys. And it's a lot cheaper to feed a whole army in the Middle East than it is to feed a few astronauts up on the space station. So, like Mike talked about, the cost of just the logistics and the cost of getting food, anything, out of Earth's gravitational pull is difficult. So the only way to get to Mars, to get to all these other places, is once you get into space to be able to be self-sufficient. You can't do that without plants. And plants, just like humans, have adapted to live in 1G. They've adapted to Earth's gravity, Earth's atmosphere, Earth's soil, Earth's... Everything. Like, yeah, insects. I mean, it's... Just think about just any forest, okay? So we'll start with the soil. Your soil is based off of what geological activity is taking place. So you might have some old lava. So you have some, you know, lava uh, soil that gets crushed and you can hear it as glass. If you take soil like in northern Idaho and you rub it together, you can hear that glass, that volcanic substrate. So then you start there. Then you start adding your biotic factors, your specific bacteria that live in that soil. Then you have the gases that live in that soil. And different size soil pores will have different openings that move gas and water through them. Then you have, you get a little bit bigger, and you have your insects. going. You have your worms that make holes through the soil, leave different nutrients. You have insects that get devoured by other things. And as you keep going up the food, way, food web, everything gets more and more complex. And that plant is designed specifically to live in a certain environment with certain pressures, certain predator pressures, certain bacteria, virus pressures, drought pressures. And now, just like a human, you're going to take it out of an area it's been adapted to living for some t- thousands to millions of years. And in one generation, you're going to expect it to survive in space. But Nick, I want it and I want it now. And that is the best and worst part about humanity, right? We want it as soon as, if we can think it, we want to do it. And we want to go to space. And it's not exactly one generational. NASA's been working on figuring out what uh, plants to bring into space for a while. And they've actually grown a few plants in space. Mostly so they've grown lettuce and some flowering plants. And they're working on some chilies. Um, They have two different, uh, as you call them, modules on the International Space Station. They have veggie, which is a plant growing module that's attached and astronauts go in there and they do a lot of the work they water they control most of the things they do the harvesting and all that they control the lighting and then you have the APH automatic automated plant habitat and that's pretty much self-sufficient astronauts only go in to harvest the plant or do some maintenance and They've grown lettuce, and this is a fun fact for you, Mike. So the Americans, they grew some lettuce up on the space station in their veggie habitat. They sent it all back down to Earth, and it got tested to make sure it was okay because it could have heavy metals that are floating around in the space station. We don't really know. Radiation, which I assume we'll talk about later. Radiation, a lot, a lot of things are trying to kill you in space. And so they sent it back down to Earth, got it tested, and the next time they grew it, they were able to eat it. What do you think Russia did? They just ate it, no questions asked. Russia just ate it. (laughs) Lettuce don't kill me, I kill lettuce. Yeah, but, (laughs) yeah, that's one of my favorite stories. I love that. It's like, the United States sent their crops back down to Earth to be inspected. Russia who had grown lettuce in the space station a year before, had already eaten it. (laughs) So um, as plants keep moving up into space and we figure out what we want to grow, we look kind of into industrial ag to figure out what can grow and the science to figure out what each of these needs to grow and what's going to be there in the future. And a lot of people have talked 
about using plants for a lot of things. I mean, obviously food is the first thing you can think of, but also, what do plants do? They remove carbon dioxide from the air. They're carbon scrubbers, right? They clean your air. A lot of people have talked about using those plants not only as a way to produce food for astronauts, but also to create a cleaner environment. Food, growing food, growing plants, has a positive impact on people. Anyone who has a garden can tell you so, but NASA's actually put it into quantitative data. The astronauts that tend to veggie and then eat the food from veggie, their Growing Lettuce in Space project, it brings them happiness because for as long as humans have traveled, we have brought whatever plants we enjoyed with us. When Europeans came to North America, we brought a slew of European native plants. Was that bad for the ecosystem? Yes, it, actually it was, yes, it was. <laughs> but we kind of saw vice versa. We brought other foreign plants back to Europe. But luckily we won't have that problem on Europa, Mars, or Venus. That's true. So, uh, who knows, though? How, how awesome... That would be the first time we'd be cheering for an invasive species, right? Like if... <laughs> if if some legume got out and started growing wild on Mars. That would be awesome. And Nick, maybe we, maybe us rocket scientists could help out a little bit, making the biologist and uh, botanist lives a little easier. We've talked about completely changing Mars. Now, when we think about living on Mars, we're, we're thinking about living in domes, which we'll definitely get to because that's a huge topic point. But I just want to throw these kind of random ideas out since we're talking about soil temperatures etc etc just uh, some fun fun numbers for y'all mars is about negative 60 degrees celsius which is like negative 80 degrees fahrenheit venus is 462 degrees celsius which is about 860 864 degrees fahrenheit and europa which eventually i want to talk about because Europa is like a dark horse that I absolutely love. We actually don't care about the surface of the temperature of the plant of the moon. We care what's underneath the ice of that moon. But Nick, what if I could tell you, what if I told you that we could use nukes to help melt Mars's ice poles, to help create more greenhouse gases, put water in the atmosphere, and maybe, maybe make that atmosphere more viable for those precious trees and plants you want to grow. I like that idea. I was, in fact, going to use that ice to grow my plants, but <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out. We can use subsurface water. Well, hopefully that won't melt, that won't melt all the ice. And just because I mentioned it, we wouldn't want to nuke Europa because it's an ice moon. Again, we don't care about the surface Europa. We care about what's under the, the ice. We also wouldn't want to make, we also wouldn't want to nuke Venus. Well, because we actually want to cool Venus. We don't want to heat Venus up. So... Just an overlap. Mars, we want to heat up. Venus, we want to cool down. Europa, we want to dig underneath the ice, and hopefully there's liquid water, which we could survive like a submarine base. But nuking Mars might actually be not the worst idea. United States, sign me up. <laughs> we would need a lot of nukes. We'd probably have to work together as a planet to nuke Mars. But all those nukes would probably increase... The greenhouse gases increase the water vapor, increase the atmosphere, which then collects more sunlight, which helps warms the planet, which helps it more viable for your plants. And hopefully we don't nuke all the ice because a big component for landing on even our own moon, other planets' moons, other planets is landing on ice caps. Because that way we could turn that frozen water into fresh water to water our plants and water ourselves. Yeah, I. Uh, so one of the biggest problems with plants and humans right they both require a lot of water <laughs> those pesky humans needing water all the time yeah if we could just figure out a way where humans didn't need to eat or drink we would uh, <laughs> we'd be on mars right now see there's a few other ways of maybe terraforming mars um that didn't involve nuclear weapons which i am a fan of but I like blowing things up. I like explosions. <laughs> um, do, what do you think about halo carbon factories? Is that the factories of simply mining around the surface of Mars to create more greenhouse gases and to pump them into the air to help create the atmosphere thicker? Yeah, pretty much. It'd take a lot longer. I'm, I, what exactly is the time frame for the nuclear weapons? I think it's like 200 years. Yeah, so I think this would take longer than that. I, I I'm all for it. I I want to be on Mars before I die. So anything that gets me a little closer. If you need a mechanic, mechanical engineer to go up there and help work on the machines, I am fit and ready. Anyway, after the resume, <laughs> but I don't think it's viable to 
terraform the outer surface of Mars quite yet. Now I want to pivot back to Mars because Mars is the golden child. And we'll talk about Venus real quick. I feel like it's very underrated because it's it's actually easier to cool the planet than it is to heat the planet up, even though we're having the opposite problem on Earth. And Venus is also very similar to Earth's gravity, so it means less working out. And you know us Americans, Nick. We we aren't always the best at working out. But you had me at Netflix. <laughs> It, it, I would be so disappointed in you if the first thing you did on a different planet was watch Netflix. But Venus, hey man, what if the new season of The Expanse came out? I'm gonna hit you. I'm gonna I'm gonna fly to Oregon and hit you. <laughs> but Venus, very similar to us with gravity and size, and we can cool it quite easily. We just need to stop the volcanoes from erupting. Now the major hurdles are the lava and the acid but the atmosphere is there it's dense hot and poisonous but maybe with plants nick like sunflower seeds sunflower plants soak up radiation maybe maybe we make some filtration factories on venus with plants and clean up the air a little bit cool it down a little bit from a nice 864 degrees fahrenheit down to 85 make it same temperature of california but infinitely a lot better than california because it's not california i mean inherently venus is better than california (laughs) the mount the volcano acid sulfuric planet is already better than california if you gave me a choice i would i think you know where i'd be (laughs) (laughs) oh i'd probably be right there alongside you but i think before we pivot back to Mars, I think Venus is a more optimal choice. It's not as big, if I remember correctly, as Mars, but it seems a little bit more viable. And then Europa, I want to talk about and save later. Don't worry, folks. I'll get to Europa because it sounds like it'd be a, it should be a sci-fi horror movie. But Nick, back to Mars. So we have our factories trying to produce more greenhouse gases. We have our nukes. What are some other ways we could live slash terraform on mars so let's talk about water real quick so we need water and that's a given mars has water on it and there's a few places it has water it's it's predominantly subsurface and there's a lot of ways that we could get that water i think the most viable option is a mechanical drill to drill down beneath the subsurface into the frozen sur- the frozen part of Mars. And then on that point, you we need to bring water, but you'd add you'd actually add water into the frozen ice it'd be ice at this point. It's still as you consider it subsurface water, but it's frozen. So you drill down and you'd bore a hole, and then you'd pump water into that hole. Warm water. And then that water melts the kind of water around it. You you heat it as well, usually with you take the exhaust of whatever power system you're using, or you use power just to heat it. And then you pump that water up, and that water that's in there is a constant source of cool of heating that well, essentially, and it'll move out as time goes on, and eventually you have to drill a whole new hole once the everything becomes too weak. But that's one way to do it, where you drill down, and then you pump hot water in, and then that hot water pu- melts the other water. It gets pumped up to the surface, a portion of that water continues to get melted or gets pushed back down, heated up, melts more water, more water gets melted up, treated, and that's one way to get water on Mars. So that almost reminds me, Nick, of a very similar episode record of asteroid mining, of getting water out in space. It's I implore everyone to go give that a listen to because it all kind of ties together, but very similar processes of mining frozen water on different moons and planets could be implemented to get that water. Now, if we terraform the planet where we're trying to get that water out into the atmosphere, we could do that method. But I'm thinking if we are trying to want it now, not thinking as generational as I like to, but because I'm kind of, I'm not going to lie, I'm kind of greedy on this one. I want to be on Mars now. We could live in dome or man-made buildings, close off facilities, drill that frozen water, as Nick is saying, and pump it into our system and we could have an entire ecosystem with recycled water going in and out in and out in and out indefinitely now it's hard but it is possible yeah now mar water is going to be really important on mars because especially at the beginning 
because I've looked at this problem for almost two weeks now and I can't figure a way around it. I I believe, and the science is still out on this, so something could come out that could completely change my mind, but I believe most of the crops grown for the first group of people on Mars is going to be hydrophonics. And you're going to need a lot of water for that as well as for the human population. Have you thought about um, bringing liquid hydrogen and oxygen along with the trip and then just converting that into water? In my head, it's saying, of course, Mike, I thought about that. But no, I haven't really looked into that. Well, with uh, density wise, you can have far more hydrogen and oxygen because that's what we use pretty much to launch rockets already. So if we keep some extra, we could turn that into water. Having it as a liquid is more dense and we can contain more of it, which means it fits in a smaller spot. And we could fit a lot more in it, like think, like, like uh, compressed air. It's a lot easier to fit 100 PSI into a bottle than it is to try to take an entire room of, that's full of 100 PSI with you. It's a lot easier to carry a bottle. So we could do it that way. I'm more pro towards the recycling the water. Like, yes, I completely agree with you, Nick. I think the water is going to be the key factor. Water and food are... I think building structures, which we'll talk to you in a bit, are is actually kind of the easier part. I think the biggest hurdles is water and food and radiation. Now, Nick, since we're talking about food and water, did you come across the Biosphere 2 experiment that happened in the 1990s in the Arizona desert? Yeah, I did come across that. And I think it's important, like, the important part of that is we can create a self-sufficient environment, but there is a lot of waste in that just mainly due to space and plants that would have no really good effect on humans in sp- in space besides emotional support. Yes, I, and I also think it's fair to say we've learned a lot since the 1990s. But for those who don't know, the Biosphere 2 experiment, which was, I think, taken part by a third party, was in NASA, did an experiment in the Arizona desert where they, lo- they locked a bunch of people in, they tried doing it for an entire year, where they would grow their own food, recycle their own water, pretty much how it would be living on Mars. And boy, did this fail horribly. The food, the, the work to food ratio was terrible. It, you might not think about that, but having that right enough people where you're producing enough food but not being stressed because you have to work 24 seven is, is a lot harder than you think. And a lot of the crops were dying, like they weren't prepared for that. Uh, they were minute things like clothes would rip and they had to sew their own clothes back up. And worst come, I, I can't imagine if that was your own spacesuit. I can't imagine they're bringing that many extra spacesuits onto a different planet or moon for years on end. So food and water is very, very important. And another big issue was infestation. Now, Nick, you're very good at protecting the environment from not bringing invasive species or other species we're not supposed to be. And with planets, it's the same. With this experiment, uh, roaches infestated and demolished that experiment. Granted, that probably wouldn't happen because usually with space programs, they're very thorough, clean everything and check everything. But it could be something smaller than we don't realize. Someone could be carrying a bacteria in their stomach or gut or something they've eaten, and that could ruin the whole crops. And that's that's something to think about. Something even more minute. So I don't know if you read about this, but uh, the veggie program on the International Space Station, they're going... A flowering plant and the the veggie module resets so all the electronics reset and because there's no there's microgravity but there's not really gravity in space there's no air movement really of convection of warm air rising in cold air sinking because there's not that much gravity so most of the air is moved around through man-made forces predominantly fans that were on the space station they were on this veggie module and they reset when the whole module reset, but the crew didn't know they had to hit the reset button. And because there was no air movement in the water through just the surface tension of water, wasn't able to, you know, normally if water is on a plant, gravity will pull it down to the ground. But when it gravity's not acting on it, it just sits there. So what happens, the entire plant, a lot of these plants died of mold, except for maybe like a few of the plants lived, I think. I can't remember exactly how many. They didn't have a lot to begin with. And then that mold is from a spore that it's very small. There's no way to adequately remove it. We touch on this in invasive species of uh, predator removal. When you move a plant from its native environment to a new environment that it doesn't have predators, it does really well. 
When we do it, we call it predator removal. When nature does it, we call it an invasive species. It's the same thing in space. If we remove a plant to and grow it in space where it has no predators, it might do really well if given the right conditions. But if we bring its prey or its predators along, it's going to do the same as is on Earth. It's still going to be attacked by those predators. But if we can remove the predators and be very strict on what we allow, similar to how New Zealand is a very agriculture heavy uh, country, they have a white list. There's certain species of plants and animals that are allowed in the country, and if it's not on that list, it's not allowed in. And those plants that are allowed in need to be tested to make sure they're not bringing pathogens in because they're so reliant on growing foreign species in their country. A single pathogen could destroy their economy. It needs to be very much like that in space. It needs to be very strict because imagine you bring carrots up to space and that's what you're predominantly going to survive on. And somehow a pathogen that kills carrots and once it gets in the soil, you can't get rid of it, makes its way there to Mars, you're SOL. Yes. I think it's also an important fact that microgravity versus these other planets and celestial bodies is a little bit different, but they are still extremely related. You might have lesser gravity, but that gravity might play a huge role on the effect how a plant grows. And like Nick said, one little spore, one little bacteria, one little fungi, your food's gone and there's no you got to wait for another ship that's traveled 35 million miles to come bring you food or save you. You're you're screwed. That's that's just the end of it. Yeah, there's not much you can do. And there's another problem is there like Mike said, there's a vastly huge difference between growing plants in the vacuum of space versus Mars. You in Mars, you have a media, you have soil, and whether you can or can't use that soil, that's another story. But and there's gravity there in space. Maybe you have microgravity through centrifugal force through a spinning module, but maybe you don't. How do you like? Like I said, as much as I think this is not the best way to go from efficiency standpoint, from Earth for space travel, hydrophonics may be the most efficient way to do it. You can't really do that in zero gravity. You can't just have water sitting around. But on another planet, you can. Yes, on Mars, you definitely can. Which kind of brings me to the prep of, let's say we want to be Mars there, and we want to be it now. We could send robots before humans get there to start building these greenhouses for plants, to, to start prepping the build sites for us. Like a one robot that won a competition from AI Space Factory that made a 3D printer that takes Mars surface soil and another chemical that and turns the material into a filament like a 3D printer and will print a house. And it's really great because this 3D printer is capable of building something larger than itself, which that might seem insignificant to a lot of people, but it's extremely impressive for a robot when a robot can build something bigger than itself. Or we could send drones to dig for us. We could bury ourselves underground much like ants and being underground would have its benefits we wouldn't have to worry as much about leakage to the outside world being exposed to storms radiation the cold much more protection and more thermal insulation and also not to mention possibility of turning that underground soil once we're underground into more farmland granted it will be more uv lights more solar panels to create energy or i don't know maybe a, being a nuclear core with us but it seems that's the most viable option to me, Nick. Do you concur? Yeah, I also came across the same thing, is that um, living underground be probably the best for humans. Now, I think personally, for so this, this is an important part of space travel is morale of any mission, really. You need to keep people happy. And this is part of the challenges, because if we just wanted humans to exist in space, humans would eat algae all day every day. It is the most efficient way to grow protein in space. It requires the least water. You get the most bang for your buck. Mike, do you know any humans who could be happy to eat algae all day every day? Californians. All right. We're done with the Californians. <laughs> don't bring them into this happy place. No, because there's no tofu and I don't know if... Well, yeah, no, so Nick. I, algae's probably vegan, right? I don't know. But no, Nick, I don't know anyone who wants to eat algae every day. Every single day, at least the most, at least for the rest yeah. of their life, for at least like the next five years. Imagine eating algae for five years. Oof, big oof. And before we get away from it, with 
Venus, I don't think we can go underground because of the because of the lava. Um, so it would have to be surface. For Europa, we couldn't live on the surface. We'd have to live underneath the ice. For Mars, we might be able to do both. Just wanted to point that out there before you continue your point, Nick. Yeah, so um, for Mars, we it receives sunlight, but it does not receive as much sunlight as the Earth does. So even if we did have a greenhouse on the surface, which everyone can imagine, you know, your circular greenhouse on Mars, you'd still need to add LEDs to that to get plants enough sunlight to do what they need to do, flower, produce, all that stuff. So especially for the first generations until we fine tune genetic engineering, 100% what Nick's saying is we're going to need a little extra UV light. Yeah, and this is the sad part about Mars is, yes, Mars has soil, but that soil's got a lot of stuff in it that's not good for plants, and even though plants will grow with it, it's not good for humans. So perchlorates are found pretty much all over Mars, and they're toxic to humans. So having those in our crops is actually the opposite of what we want to do. Um, so I have, uh, so Mars light, the amount of sunlight, ultraviolet radiation Mars receives, is 43% of what Earth receives. So we would have to make up the difference with LEDs. Is that solely because just pure sunlight, or is that ultraviolet light not being captured in the atmosphere? It could be either. It's it's 43% of what plants need. Mars is, yeah, Mars is fourth planet from the, yeah, so it make yeah, that makes sense. So No, I'm sorry, I was just trying to figure out if it was just pure sunlight or UV. I think, I think you're right with just pure sunlight, because it's literally more farther than earth is from the sun yeah and i think you said this that mars has a third of the earth's gravity but i'm gonna throw it out there again that's a big deal ladies and gentlemen especially for a long time for both humans and plants yeah and like mars obviously has third gravity less pressure even plants need a certain amount of pressure to survive they need about one pound per square inch in their greenhouse to survive humans need about one pound per square inch to survive of pressure it's weird nick how we've lived on this planet for our entire species lives and we've gotten accustomed to it yeah it's like thousands of years of evolution lead us to adapt to one very specific environment but there is hope i think i I, when i'm researching this i did research some plants nick you'd be proud of me i was i i'm impressed i was looking at pothos peace lilies and dandelions for plants mainly because pothos and peace lilies are really great at producing oxygen and uh collecting carbon dioxide which is huge because you don't want your air scrubbers to be working as hard as they can 24 7 for years on end you want them to be reliable but not overworked and pothos and peace lilies can help do that but the problem with that is you can't always well you can't you can't get any food from them they're more just for breathing we could cross pollinate them with genetic splicing to another food plant like we use uh, rust resistant wheat and we could do very something very similar to those plants to both produce food and produce oxygen but dandelions caught my attention because i think dandelions get a bad rap and i'll say it here yeah i'm a i'm a anti-dandelion fan they're they're a pest in my forest i like dandelions you know why nick Mm, don't tell me you're one of those kids wait two options one you eat them two you're the you're you know how to flick them at people well both but every part of them is useful you can you can make the roots into coffee you can eat the leaves they don't die they will go through concrete they are stubborn little bastards and that's absolutely why i love them Granted, I don't... They're an invasive species. I don't... So Hey, I never said I wanted them in my lawn. Them. I just said I love them. No, no, no. What I'm saying is that's what we want. We want plants that can tolerate pretty much any condition and are tough, and they're able to colonize new environments because it's... There's no... Every plant we bring to Mars will be an invasive species. So <laughs> might as well make them a good one. We. It seems like we need to come up with a new name for introduce invasive species on another planet. I feel like this should be a separate name of a introduced species to a different planet. Country versus planet should be two different things. It's funny you bring up a new classification of plants that were introduced. So I looked a lot into the soil of Mars and what that was, and I was trying to relate it to soils found on Earth. Now, I'm sure you know this, Mike, and I'm sure most of our listeners know this because it's pretty much common knowledge. There are 12 soil orders on Earth. 
and don't ask me to name them all but uh so i was trying to figure out which soil order which characteristic which soil characteristics on earth most lent themselves to mars it turns out a lot of soil scientists are thinking that a whole new soil order would be added for martian soil called astrosols now some of the other common soil order names histosols andosols artosols you kind of lost me nick a little bit could you run it back a little bit my uh soil knowledge isn't the greatest yeah, so that was in fact a joke. Uh, no one would know that because no one cares a shit about soil. But except you, <laughs> except me. There's uh, there's twelve soil orders, and most soils can be. It's kind of like a Linnaean classification. Or how you would, like uh, plants? No, we'll talk about. Let's go back to trees, Mike. <laughs> You're so happy to talk about this. So. When you you have trees, you have your basics, you have like your conifers, which are your quote unquote Christmas trees and your, uh, your gymnosperms and for plants, you have your gymnosperms, your angiosperms, or your conifer, for trees, you have your conifers, you have your hardwoods and, uh, you know, your hardwoods is your, your maples, your oaks, stuff like that, that, uh, loser leaves in the winter. So you kind of, you know, that it's kind of the same with soils. Now, Every single soil is very different. Every soil is influenced by local terrain, topography, geological history. Like northern Idaho, you have a lot of volcanic activity. Different areas, like drier climates, you have different soils. And the amount of moisture plays a huge role in what soils you have. So they're all varied, but the soil scientists boil it down to 12 basic families. uh, Orders is what they call them. And so... I was trying to figure out, okay, if we're going to go plants on Mars, what is Martian soil most like? And Nick, what is it? And the answer was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we had to make a whole new soil order, which is exciting in itself because I don't know when the last soil order was made, but it was uh, it was probably before I was born and probably before maybe around the time my soil teacher was born so this is all exciting this is a whole new territory of soil engineering it is and so i'm gonna give everyone a little background to soil like i said I talked about a little bit previously but soil is in all a sense dirt now when you think of soil and dirt you're not thinking of what i'm thinking of when i think of soil i think of different nutrients that are in the soil different biotic and abiotic factors so geologically you have rocks that get weathered away and then those rocks as they get weathered they break down into certain minerals and plants need certain minerals to survive so your basic nutrients plants need carbon hydrogen and oxygen that's pretty obvious right everything that's alive needs carbon hydrogen and oxygen then you have your macronutrients your nitrogen your phosphorus and your potassium now you might know something about this if you ever use fertilizer each fertilizer bag you buy should have what we call the npk value and it's just a set of numbers that tells you how many parts nitrogen how many parts phosphorus and how many parts potassium is that fertilizer those are your big nutrients that you need macro big macronutrients your primary macronutrients then you have your secondary macronutrients and that's calcium magnesium and sulfur you need those your nitrogen phosphorus and potassium is more important but you need your calcium magnesium and sulfur and then you have your micronutrients and that's your iron which red we all know that mars has a lot of iron on it you have your manganese zinc copper boron and i never pronounce this right molybdenum and then chlorine now the good thing about martian soil is they have all of these nutrients the problem is i don't know if we could use all those nutrients so think about you know how everyone talks about vitamins and like b12 and all that and how you can take b12 vitamins all the day but it doesn't do anything for you because it's not in a form your body can use it's kind of the same way with mars yeah i i came across something very similar just to help connect it with people um imagine if you have a bunch of vitamins you're going to pee it out your body can't process all that at once it can only handle a certain amount it only needs a certain amount so it just gets rid of the excess or doesn't use the excess yeah but i don't i don't know if this is an issue of excess so this is a good way to think about how plants grow. So think of, so I listed 16 elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, iron, manganese, zinc, copper, boron, molybdenum, and chlorine. So think of a, 
a whiskey barrel with the top open. And on the side of each of those staves, you know, the wood parts of the barrel is one of those elements. And say we're, say uh, phosphorus, a macronutrient, not a basic nutrient, but still a very important one. Say that that phosphorus one is way short. Your phosphorus stave of that barrel is down about halfway. All the other nutrients are at the top, but that phosphorus one is only half of the height it should be. Now try and fill it up with water. The water represents how well that plant's growing to grow. Even though all of your nutrients are there in abundance, except for that phosphorus nutrient, that barrel, as soon as it reaches that halfway mark, is going to leak out that side of that phosphorus nutrient. It can't get higher than half because it's missing missing that phosphorus. I don't know about you, Nick, but I don't want to be leaking li- whiskey. No, that's that's like your worst case scenario. We'll make this easier on people. We'll pretend it's a wine barrel. <laughs> no, but I, I, keeping with the soil, the... Robot that 3D printed houses using Mars soil, uh, synthetic Mars soil, is very interesting to me because they mixing another agents with it. I believe it was a bacteria of sort. I, I could be mistaken on that. Yes, I think I actually ran across the same thing. Isn't uh, yeah, bacteria and organic matter. And one thing, real quick, that I thought was interesting about this is that they didn't want they were all the uh, concrete, if you will, that was produced. They wanted to keep it covered up so that they kept that organic matter from leech leaking out into mars so that in the future they wouldn't pick up that organic matter and say oh shit there's life on mars yeah that's i mean that is an issue but i think to the point where if we get to that point or we're building houses on mars i don't think we care anymore this land is your land this land is my land but modifying the soil definitely makes it more my land but i i, I want to stick with the soil a little bit because tying it back with sort of plants i'm gonna kind of switch with fungi the underground seems a much better solution with me don't get me wrong having surface buildings such as uh, on top of mars like the 3d building structure is important because you need hatches you need you know sunlight experiments uh also just the psychology of a human being which we'll get to in a bit of simply be able to not be in a confined space for years upon years upon years is huge but underneath the soil we're we're starting to hit major rock we're we can create our own caves. We could use that soil and mix it with other fungi and our own excrement because don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, our waste has to go somewhere too and start converting that soil and then start transferring that soil upwards. So modify it down below and switch it up top. It won't grow life up top, but it'll have more of those minerals that we need on the soil and we can start expanding upon that once we start expanding out our colony on a planet or exoplanet. I love that idea, and you ready to bring this full circle, Mike? Is it trees? It's not trees, but it does tie back into invasive species. All right, let's go. Let's bring it on. So you talked about earlier, talking about how having robots or somebody set up an environment for humans to live in. Now, I think that is a great idea, and I think the best way to do that is to bring a certain set of primary pioneer species. So like we talked about in... The... Are you talking about like the lichens and moss, like pioneer species in that form? Yep, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Hey, I know something about plants. I feel like I need a gold star or something. Well, get you a bottle of whiskey. We'll call it <laughs> even. So like we touched on a few other podcasts, but as an area becomes available to plants, the first species that move in are simple. Lichen, fungi, mosses, very simple plants. You're not getting your complex plants. You're not going to have trees right away. You need these simple plants to live and die and build up your organic matter in the soil. Another thing they're doing is they're rendering diff- minerals. They're taking minerals and turning them, using them and outputting them as something that other plants can use. Now, if we are going to send people, you know, robots, someone to Mars as like a, an advanced group to get everything set up for everyone else, I think we'd very much benefit from sending a bunch of primary of uh, these pioneer species from the Arctic Circle and other, they call them extremophiles, plants and bacteria that live in just the craziest environments on Earth, whether they be really hot or really cold. You know, these species could live in the... Uh, Shoot, what's the uh, the geyser in Yellowstone National Park called? Old Faithful? Yeah, Old Faithful all the way to bacteria that survives on glaciers, mercury lakes, salt lakes. All this, this, the salt lake in Utah have more life on them than 
places do on Mars, but life will obviously find a way. That's an extreme environment. The amount of salt in those environments would cause most cells to erupt. So one of the biggest problems with Martian soil is, talked about earlier, the poor chlorates, the salts in it. Uh, the perchlorates, they cause a decline in chlorophyll content in plant leaves. They reduce the oxidizing power of plant roots. They reduce this, the size of the plants, both above and below ground. And they accumulate in the leaves. And they're toxic to humans. So humans, say this is lettuce, would die from eating leaves contaminated with perchlorate. So Russians don't eat those. Yeah, there's no perchlorates in the International Space Station, as far as the United States knows. And, well, Russia really doesn't care. <laughs> but I've, I've thought about this, Nick, with the pioneer species. So this might be a little far-fetched, but genetically splicing a bacteria, which we've talked about in nuclear waste episode, slicing a bacteria that eats and soaks up radiation, uh, splicing it with a almost like a free-floating plant, almost like a tumbleweed almost, and simply letting it go on the Mars surface, where it's going to develop over time, producing carbon dioxide, producing oxygen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And just kind of let that be a long-term investment as we focus on a colony in some point of some part of Mars or Europa or Venus. No, I like that. Um, so another thing is th when I imagine this, I imagine a uh, bunch of soil in a greenhouse, even though we established that we need more LEDs. Now we need more LEDs to grow crops. I didn't look exactly a lot of the pioneer species i was imagining come from the arctic circle and so i can't imagine they receive that much more light than than mars does um and their whole point yes but many of those we that? can't eat many of those we can't eat which is unfortunate right well that's why when we were talking about like someone sets this up for us you're not going to be able to farm right away from mars there's too much toxins in the soil you would need these pioneer species to help remove that at the same time, so there's also, I talked about how the perchlorates are dangerous to humans. There's bacteria that eats perchlorates. So at the same time as you introduce these fungi and lichens to the ground, their whole purpose is to live and die. They're adding organic matter to the ground. Now, it's, it's up for debate. Some people believe there's organic matter on Mars. Some people believe there isn't. Now, some the people who say there isn't believe that the organic matter that the rover picked up was left over from someone touching the rover and they found remnants of it. To me personally, I can't imagine that there's organic matter on Mars. I think we're going to have to bring our own. A lot of the nutrients plant use, plants use is organic matter. 90% of it is, I'd say. Like It's very important that the nutrients is in organic form nutrients in mineral form is not that helpful. So the main benefit of establishing pioneer species to let them live and die is they're just adding organic matter to the soil. The bacteria that gets rid of perchlorates is removing that from the soil, removing other toxins. The pioneer species is it's establishing secession. Now we talked about this in fire and invasive species. Secession is when is the process that nature takes from undeveloped to say forest some end game we don't really know what secession would look like on mars because everything that's introduced is human introduced but if we could introduce early pioneer species that can survive in harsher terrains by the time humans are there ready to start farming we could have more traditional crops and like i mentioned hydrophonics you're not going to be able to support the is it a million people elon musk wanted by 2050 on solely hydrophonics so it's funny enough you bring that up, Nick, because I've actually kind of considered that in a different alternative. So like you said, the pioneer species eating the uh, the, the super salty Mars surface to, you know, create fertilizer for other plants in the future. I thought about the same thing with algae because algae to me is a another stubborn little bastard, but it wouldn't do well in Mars. Mars is cold, negative 40 degrees Celsius, if I remember correctly. But I can see it doing well on Venus. Lots of sulfur on Venus. It's quite warm on Venus. And granted, it might be like a red algae, which is not something we all want, but it could start that process. I think algae would be a good candidate for Venus. Now, for Mars, I think you're 100% correct with the pioneer species. 
but maybe we don't put all our eggs in one basket maybe we try to hit multiple moons and planets all at once and see what takes yeah for sure um another going back to mars uh this is something that i thought was interesting and i don't know how realistic it is so we always when we consider planets in outer space maybe just because we both fans of the expanse it seems like we consider them to not only be sources of nutrients but also they help clean the air now if we're going to go live on mars we're going to need to bring air filters and all that stuff because plants die crops fail and if you think you're going to go to mars and not have any of your crops die and not be prepared for that i'm not going with you but <laughs> mars atmosphere is a lot has a lot more nitrogen than earth's atmosphere and i'm curious to grow legumes in it so legumes your peas stuff like that they can take nitrogen from the atmosphere so right now on earth we know that due to the increased amount of co2 in the atmosphere most plants are growing better than they were when a few hundred years ago when there was less co2 in the atmosphere so i can imagine the same way with legumes now this brings me to my point of maybe we don't use these plants or at least all of them for fixing our air if all our resources are really on a budget what if we had our quote-unquote greenhouse whether that be underground above ground with led whatever it is completely different from our wherever humans are living you would need you wouldn't need to it wouldn't be wouldn't need to be as strong so your greenhouse would only need to be one pound per square inch of pressure like i said compared to five pounds per square inch that humans would need to live in it wouldn't need to be as warm as where humans were living you could have more co2 in there which would help plants than you would in a normal habitat we need 21 percent co2 but you could increase that and you can make your plants grow better let me make a bridge for you because simply it's mainly because you are correct because mainly it's just me wanting to go to mars people live underground the plants live on the surface plants get the well, that does bring the issue of radiation with our plants and such. But that's a hard one. And, yeah, like we talked about it um, uh, on space mining. We talked about the bacteria that eats radiation or th grows on radiation. That was found in Chernobyl. Thank you, Russia. So another, like I said, a big part of the soil. And to clarify, sh taken straight out of my soils class is soil is where you grow plants and dirt is when that soil gets inside so soil includes every living thing that's in there and non-living things from gases to minerals one of the most important things is the microbes the bacteria all that stuff in your soil and this is probably the best example i can give you um, so douglas fir which is our my number one crop tree it's a just conifer quote-unquote Christmas tree type tree. We grow it here for lumber out in Oregon. Well, it has a similar climate to Brazil. So we sent some Douglas firs down to Brazil to be grown down there. Perfect climate, no predators. This should be a no-brainer. It should take off and grow like a freaking rocket. Got down there and it grew. First year grew really way higher than a first year Douglas fir out here. And then it died. And the next one grew a little bit longer and then it died. What happened? There's no predators. What the fuck is the problem? mycorrhizae mycorrhizae is a fungus that grows on the outside of all of the roots of the plants pretty much every plant has mycorrhizae it essentially is a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and a microbe and that plant and the mycorrhizae increases the surface area of the root by almost two allowing it to reach more areas gather more nutrients the plant gives the mycorrhizae nutrients they work together. When you don't have that fungi, that good fungi in the soil, your plants can't grow. So when we try and send plants to Mars, we really need to make sure that we have all the fungi and microbes in the soil that they need. And this is something that I just haven't found in the research. So a lot of people do a lot of experiments with Martian soil. Well, we don't really completely know martian soil that well we got some samples headed our way everything we know now is remotely we haven't had martian soil on earth to look at it all the martian soil examples we have is rover picked it up scanned it 
and we're able to kind of tell what nutrients are there or what rocks are there, which is how we know we have all the 16 nutrients essential for plant growth. So we looked at those nutrients and said, okay, we can mimic those with stuff on Earth. So what we did is we took rocks from the Mojave to create one subset of quote-unquote Martian soil, rocks from a Hawaiian volcano, and then we, cr we took rocks from a lot of different sources and combined them in the exact, not exact, but a very close similarity to parts, elements that the Martian soil consists of. And plants grew very well in the Mojave and the volcanic soil and did not grow well in the Martian soil. And I think the problem is the organic matter. The Mojave and Hawaiian volcano, they're extreme environments, sure. But microbes still live there. You still have organic matter. You still have soil holding capacity. The Martian soil, you don't have the organic matter in that soil. Even if it's, I mean, it's, it's a fungus, it's a microbe, it's bacteria, whatever it is, you don't have that in Martian soil. So we're going to have to bring that organic matter. And which is another thing that brings us to the, what plants we want to grow in space. So everyone's seen the Martian potatoes that's a pretty pretty big one but the amount of water and effort needed to clean potatoes is is nothing for if you live on earth but you can't just turn on your tap and flush a bunch of dirt down the drain on mars most of the plants that will be grown in space will be pick and eat so think tomatoes peppers cucumbers stuff like that where you grow it and then you eat it but also think about a tomato plant Think about how much extra effort is spent in growing that tomato plant. There's a lot of organic material there that doesn't get eaten. Now, one of the things, and we could talk about this for days, so I'm just going to touch on it. Uh, and Mike, feel free to add anything. But with genetic engineering, we talked about how plants have survived and grown to live on Earth for thousands of millions of years with our gravity. But on Mars... We don't need, plants don't need to spend as much energy on growing their strength to fight against gravity to grow upwards towards the light because there's not as much energy pulling them down. Now the problem is, imagine we're trying to grow a tomato plant that spends most of its energy on growing fruit and not on growing against gravity, not on growing towards the light, not on facing gravity. How do you grow that? You'd have to grow that in a low gravity environment. And not only would you have to do that, you'd have to grow multiple varieties and cultivars in a low gravity environment to adequately figure out which plant is going to spend less energy on growing structure versus fruit. So it's almost like you can't really test it until you're in space. True. And I kind of want to, it's a little bit sideways, but I want to add on to the soil part. So I thought about the genetic engineering of a species for the, to help produce the soil and that was the genetic engineering of worms, or at least some underground species that helps turn the soil and perhaps can turn the minerals on the surface of Mars into something a little bit more earth friendly. So take a take take a worm that because living on the surface on Mars versus underneath the Mars are two different different scenarios because we don't know the depths of Mars underneath. We haven't really dug that deep to dig underneath ground is quite difficult to do on earth let alone go to another planet and do it but i'm thinking if we have introduced organisms such as fungi or worms or some burrowing animal that can process the dirt and we can make it genetic engineered so it can turn that material into something a little bit more usable or maybe get rid of some impurities that might be in it like stored up radiation or some gases like that I think that'd be also a huge factor to help grow plants and organisms on Mars or Venus. Yeah, I never really thought about that. And this this is the thing is that you're essentially having to pick what are the major drivers of crops. Now, in a commercial agriculture setting, we would say seed source, soil, and environment, water, sunlight, all that stuff. But you don't get to choose those. You get to choose seed source. And you don't really get to choose the environment. So you just have to choose seed source. And you can, in some sense, regulate your environment. You can regulate the amount of water. But you could be at a loss. And like you were talking about, the insects, which play a huge role in modern agriculture and forestry and life in general. Insects are a very underlooked part of the food web, whatever you want to call it. They're, 
whether they're helpful pests, whether they're pests, whether they're helpful like worms or, you know, they're just eat eat pests. It's That's the problem is building pollinators, building a whole new environment on space. We're probably not going to have insects because each animal you bring up there, each species is going to consume a resource, whether it be water, sunlight, whatever it is. Pollinators. Heat. And if you're not getting your return back, you're going to get rid of them. No, I don't think we'll bring them to space for a long time, but eventually we will. See, I kind of disagree with that. I don't think we're going to bring cows, pigs, and chickens to space. I can see us bringing crickets, though, or a high-protein insect where it's easy to mass grow them, doesn't take a lot to feed them, and they're high in protein count. Yeah, I, you're, I agree. I do see that happening. Now, obviously, I would love to be a cricket rancher, ride out of my horse, round up some crickets. <laughs> I, I, or at worst, think about maggots and worms. I mean, get them in the, you could put them in the soil to help fertilize and process the Martian soil, and you could also eat them. This is, unfor- I don't want to eat worms, but if I get to go to Mars, I'll eat worms. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that, on Earth, no, I'd never eat it, but if someone gave me the opportunity to go to Mars... Fuck yeah, let's uh let's get those maggot Oreos and let's have a good time. <laughs> I also think since we're still talking about food, I think synthetic meat is going to be a huge industry for for life on other planets until we can get up and running full sustainable farming. Taking a raw material like stem cells on a on in a canister and, and then regrowing them somehow or some shape or regrowing more cells and Farming synthetic meat, I think, is a real possibility because as much as I like my veggies, Nick, I I still want some high-protein food, especially if I'm going to be working out in a spacesuit, lifting up radio towers and solar panels and all that jazz. Yeah, I mean, that's personally my biggest concern about going to Mars is lack of beef. You can always have beef with me. Get it? Get it? Oh, God. Get no, I will only go to Mars if it is a pun-free atmosphere. Oh, that's a hard one. That's a, you might not be going to Mars then, Nick. Yeah, I'm not going to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I did want to talk a little bit more about soils. Um, so the Martian soil. Everyone's familiar with. Should hopefully familiar with pH, the acidity of things. Martian soil, depending on what source you read, has anywhere from 9.5 to eight and a half ph whereas say most crops like wheat prefers anywhere from four to six ph so we would need to lime the soil to reduce the ph and the good news is there are insight resources on mars that we can use to possibly lime that soil reduce the ph to something that our crops could grow in in the atmosphere yes um as well as mars like i said we talked about nitrogen being in the atmosphere but it's not readily found uh, in the soil so like i mentioned legumes like peas would be fine but most plants which pull their nitrogen out of the soil we'd have to figure out a way to turn the nitrogen in the soil make it more readily available to the plants that were there to basically devise some kind of resource some kind of fertilizer as we were there it it almost seems like we need a aerial flotation system to turn that nitrogen in the air into ammonia and then use that ammonia to help fertilize the plants on the soil. Yeah, I mean that that would definitely help. And look, I I'm a big fan of agriculture, forestry, farming. I love growing plants. I mean that's what I do for a living. But just from what I read, it just doesn't seem like the Martian soil is the medium we need to grow plants. I think we're definitely, when we get there, going to have to use hydrophonics, maybe aquaphonics, you you know, using uh, plants to eat the waste, recycling that water. It just doesn't seem like uh, Martian soil is going to work out. You know, it's nutrient, it's, it has all the nutrients, but there's a lot of toxics in that soil and we need to get rid of those. And we will need to figure out how to get rid of those once we have more than just like an outpost or so there, because like we talked about living in the, the lava tubes of Mars, living underground, we can grow those with LEDs. But to have more than a couple thousand people there, time-wise, it won't be worth it to individually harvest all those plants. You'll need to do industrial agriculture like we do on Earth. 
and for that you'll need all your crops in the same place so you'll have to use a medium like soil. You'll have to use Martian soil you'll have to figure out how to use that. So eventually we're going to have to use it. Unfortunately I don't see it as being a right away option. Like we talked about I see it more as a being we get it started with some fungi, some lichen, some bacteria, start removing the toxins and then we take that matter that's contaminated with heavy metals and toxins and we we throw it outside. We can't use that. As much as we need organic matter to be recycled into the soil, as soon as we start putting these toxins back in our soil, we can't eat those plants. So it's rendering it useless. I think it's also very important to point out, Mars surface is still really cold. We still have to overcome that hurdle because we can make the hardiest plant possible, but simply not having the right temperature for it is all for naught. Now, granted, we could definitely prep for future generations, which I think Nick is right, where we simply set up bases, we implore food, small groups, and we start thinking about long-term generationally of changing a planet. I'm leaning more towards Venus because it's easier to cool it than it is to heat up Mars. But say we intro- like we start introducing like water bears, we start in- introducing those lichens, we start introducing those worms, those fungi, those, a- we in- those algaes. We send everything in the kitchen sink at it it starts getting, even if they die, they're producing those microorganisms. So even if we have like a small farm of, I don't know, uh, say moss, and every time a moss reaches a certain length, you cut it in half and you put, you just literally throw it outside and let it do that over and over again, all that dead material is going to disintegrate into the soil and add more nutrients to make it more complex for the soil. So it's going to be, Mars's surface is going to be built on pond skeletons of plants and nutrients to order to farm to make it grow it sounds crazy but that's actually how our planet was built on too so it's it's been done before (laughs) but now we have to control it (laughs) yeah so another thing like you mentioned plants that would uh we'd have to build upon other plants well nick with the soil we have to still send that machinery to process the soil to turn the soil to build those underground mines. And I think sending robots to other planets, such as Europa, well, that's a moon, but other celestial bodies, Europa, Venus, Mars, is the first step. Get prep sites. Get that digging started. Now, for Venus, again, I don't think we can dig because of lava. I mentioned that earlier. Mars, it's going to be new because we're not quite sure the underlines of the surface of Mars. There could be, I don't know, journey to the Earth, a whole new... At a whole new planet underneath the surface of Mars. And we need to process, and maybe mining into different pockets of Mars will help kick up that dust. Well, I think autonomous drones pretty much digging an ant farm looking bases underneath is a huge point. Now, granted, I still want to be on the surface of Mars, but if there's a huge storm coming on or a huge solar spike, so that means all that radiation is coming to Mars, I want to be underground like a bunker to live that. But I think it's a dual benefit of underground, we could put more plants, fungi, bacteria, but we could also move that soil around. So maybe maybe we, there is phosphorus deep underneath the soil, and we can just mine that up towards the surface. That way we don't have to transport as many nutrients, and we don't, or we don't have to keep growing as many plants to help fertilize the soil. We could kind of cheat a little bit, have a little shortcut. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely uh, an option. It, it is funny how, um, how similar... You know, humans, we've been accustomed to industrial agriculture for a long time. I mean, agriculture is what got us out of... Hunters and gatherers. Hunters and gatherers, yeah. Like, just once we started producing food in quantities that surpassed our needs, we were able to surpass other things. And now, moving to these other planets, we're going to need to become farmers again. And I find it funny that, maybe ironic, I don't know what it is, that rocket science moving humans to other planets everything comes back down to agriculture if we can't grow plants we can't survive and there's a lot of there's a lot of different ways to grow plants for sure but a lot of the plant the ways we're used to growing plants here we're used to a lot of inputs you know if we have a pest like a insect we can use insecticide if we have an issue with our soil where you're it's uh it's too basic or it's too acidic we can fix that we're essentially going to another environment with probably the best technology of our time, but we'll have to use agriculture practices that date back thousands of years. 
because we don't have, even though we know these things, we don't have the resources to employ what we need to do. You know, if we get to Mars and we think the environment's acidic, but it turns out it's super basic, we're going to have to solve that using the technology that's there or the resources that are there. Even if we, at home, we would just, we could easily change the acidity of the soil back on Earth. But out in space, you have to gather those resources, develop them into something, and then employ them. It's, it's just, it's, it's ironic to me that as technology increases, everyone on Earth gets further and further away from agriculture. There's, what, less than 1% of the U.S. population that supports the rest of the 99%? Something like that. Something like that. But at the end of the day, it all comes back to growing food because it turns out... Everyone got to eat. No matter... <laughs> yeah. No matter how great our technology is, no matter how far we go in the solar system, how far we explore, we still need to eat. Well... Maybe not with genetic human engineering, but... That's where I was going to go, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I beat you to it. Uh, now, I, before we get into that, I keep bringing up about the radiation. I want to talk about radiation a little bit because we mentioned it in another podcast of Asteroid Mining, but I don't think people realized how dangerous radiation in space is. And it is perhaps a huge, uh, huge hill for our species to climb, more specifically, one sex of our species. So apparently, space radiation does not affect both male and females equally. Hell yeah. When, yeah, <laughs> when researching this, I came across a, a, some interesting articles. One was for genetically engineering muscle for to combat gravity deficiency, one being about genetic engineering for skeleton regeneration, and one very interesting about gravity's effect on females. Now, this will tie into the radiation, so stay with me for a little bit. Gravity affects females differently than males. So, and it, it, it seems in, exper in experimentation, uh, they mimicked the microgravity and Mars gravity effects on females, female mice, I should be more specific, but... There wasn't a huge difference, but there was still a difference. So a study called the Partial Weight Bearing in Female Rats is a proof of concept about Martian and microgravity that these scientists tested a, the gravity and they showed really strange results such as like female rats showed 11.62% hind limb grip force decreasing and 11.84% decrease in, well, I'm going to mess this word up, solace myofiber size now granted overall this wasn't a big big difference but this is when radiation comes into play so microgravity is already affecting females a little bit more than males granted just as solely on rats with humans we've only been going to space for what 50 years nick something like that not not a lot of people but still not the best sample size we'd want but radiation will be very dangerous for women because it affects their sexual organs more than males so if we do start a colony reproduction is going to be hard for our species now granted the russians experimented with sex in space i believe in oh during the cold war era i can't remember and they're always first aren't they 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 always are but they never get the credit we did it nas america did it uh well on record we didn't do it but we both uh, both a married couple that they didn't tell nasa that they were married both went to space for like nearly a year together so come on we all know. Come on. But NASA is very hush hush about sex in space. Like, they really don't like talking about that topic. But this, the radiation. Go I blame the Puritans. <laughs> blame the Spanish Inquisition. No one expects the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> <laughs> this radiation it can cause more birth defects because of the, uh, affecting the o ovaries. And I'm not quite sure with how it will affect breast milk because it's never been done before. If it's affecting women more, now granted, it's not affecting women that much more, but still affecting them more. I'm not sure how that would affect with giving life in space or another planet. Because again, Mars has a lighter atmosphere. It's getting bombarded by more radiation. And long exposure to radiation, I hate to tell you all this, folks, it's bad. So I'm not quite sure how that would affect long-term humans with radiation. Of course, we'll probably talk about that in genetic engineering. But also researching this is other science, mainly, well, other scientists in different fields have created technology that's not dedicated for space exploration, but I can see it being used. So 
In 2007, I came across an article called The Genic- Genetic Engineering for Skeleton Regenerative Medicine. The researchers were focused on repairing and helping people with poor bone or cartilage and help regenerate what a person is lacking. To me, this is a, a method or I was thinking it could be utilized to help astronauts travel from one planet to another, one celestial body to another. So when you're on Mars and there's only 40% of the gravity, you're taking this almost medicine, this process to help your bone density so that way you could actually return to Earth in case of emergency or something like that. Now, there are some genetic modifications for muscles. And again, I want to go back to females a little bit it has been shown, like with the lab rats, that there is more muscle loss or grip, grip loss in females than there are males on a small scale. Granted, this is just rats, so lots of asterisks. But I'm Mike. But I have some more questions. Like, how does it affect different species? Granted, we've done this rats. Is it the same with humans, pigs, dogs, uh, crickets? If we're going to need protein in space, is it going to affect those different sexes differently? For all those who don't know, during a solar eclipse, insects are quiet. They don't mate during a solar eclipse. Will being on a different planet affect an insect's breeding periods, their 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 cycles? What about a plant cycle where it's you know like a hardwood loses its leaves during the winter? Will the days on Mars and the years on Mars are different than Earth? Will they be able to adjust? Does it scale? So if I if a rat is losing eleven percent of their highland grip force, will a female also lose eleven percent, or the more larger the animal? The less, the more grip strength loss. Long-term effects. How, like, what other organs does it affect? I imagine radiation for a pituitary gland at long terms are not great. And I don't know how, speaking of, like, periods and cycles, how it will affect a woman's reproduction cycle with all that radiation. Now, men, I mean, from what I know, as the worst is we become sterile. It doesn't kill us. Now, granted, don't get me, radiation poisoning can lead to cancer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's equal across both sexes. These two sexes, it doesn't seem space gives a fuck. So the it's definitely a lot more questions needing answers when it comes to radiation and different sexes and different species and how it affects people differently. Because I imagine a person with European background where their skin is lighter so that it gets in more vitamin C and D for, like from nutrients from the environment is going to be a lot different than a person with Ethiopian background where their skin's darker. Will that affect in space? Will a person with certain genomes affect in space? Will certain hair color even affect in space? Because that hair color means such and such. Or, yeah, I don't know. So with that in mind, Nick, I think it's time to talk about human genetic engineering since I keep rambling on about us humans. Yeah, I think uh, first off, we need to talk about how funny it is that it is in fact nature that will end racism and sexism (laughs) if we all can or can't survive in space due to... uh, no matter what our genetics are. Um, <laughs> wanted to add one thing real quick. Uh, so you talked about plants in space. and So the moon, which has uh, 28 days of light and then 20 days of dark, plants can't do that. Plants can't uh, suit up or run up, get their systems going for 28 days and then shut down for 28 days. They're not designed that way. Most plants, when they shut down for like winter, that's a... Uh, responding to a set of stimuli of the environment of a cold stimuli. So they're a certain number of days below freezing, then they'll shut down. So it is curious of how they will react on Mars of different sunlight, but I th- different uh, temperatures. But like we talked about with um, actually the birth order episode, when I talked about how we can grow trees really, really tall, as long as they don't face any stress. I think it might be the same way. So we can grow plants on Mars all year long as long as we keep the conditions good but we need to expose them to uh, low temperatures to shut them down so that they can have a winter growing uh winter and summer growing season do we want them though to have a winter and summer season or we just want them like a 24 7 365 day a year growing season that's a good question see i really as i'm thinking about this as we go on most most of my background is not in continually growing trees because that's bad for trees on Earth. That's not what you want to do. But now that we're talking about it, it's like maybe that's what we want to do. You know, we want to continually grow plants. We don't need an off season. Like I said, we already have to supplement the natural sunlight uh, with LEDs. 
and maybe temperature. So we don't need an off season. So you don't need a, a winter wheat cover crop. You could continually grow whatever you need. Uh, okay, real quick before we get off topic again. We talked about what plants you want to grow, predominantly pick and pulls. The amount of energy it takes to have like an oven or to boil potatoes in space is astronomically more in space than is on Earth. So the plants that you have to do less to are way better. For example, in the International Space Station, they have an oven that can cook one cookie at a time, and it took two hours to cook one cookie. Now, imagine boiling potatoes, boiling a whole mess of potatoes to feed 50 people, ten say 10 people. Now, I personally can eat about two and a half pounds mashed potatoes per meal. I'm guessing, though, we would use probably either an induction heater or we would use microwave. We wouldn't use the traditional boiling of water because it seems like a waste of water. Probably. No, you're probably right. But that's there's still a lot of energy. I mean, how long does it take you to bake a sh- tray of cookies? What, 15, 20 minutes? We cook very different cookies. I think for me, it's literally about 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Yeah. Uh, by when I cook cookies, what I meant to say is my wife makes cookies. <laughs> are you sure you're not just zoning out and all of a sudden the cookies are in front of you? That There's... There's a very real possibility that that is exactly what I am talking about. I don't know exactly how long it takes to make cookies, but I do know it's less than two hours. (laughs) Yes, it's less than two hours. Less than two hours per one cookie. (laughs) Yes. Now, I I do know it takes longer to bake and boil in uh, Denver, you know, places with high altitude, and it's the same as in space. So ideally when we get to mars it's going to be a simpler diet you're going to use ready to eat stuff that's right there you don't have time to clean off the potato and you're not growing potatoes let's be honest here yeah starry uh what's the guy's name the martian what's his name tom cruise sorry tom cruise nope try again matt damon it they're like the same person one believes in scientology and one doesn't yep that's a huge difference in my book (laughs) <laughs> either way yes but andy rear for written the martian did quite good work on that with like the whole fertilizer and such like that it's yeah you really can't talk about growing plants in space or you can't listen to anyone talk about growing plants in space without someone mentioning the martian he did it have you read or seen the martian i i have seen it i have not read it it's the book's far better than the movie but he he did good he did justice to his space exploration yeah i like the movie and uh, move, the book's always better than the movie, so I, I believe it. Right. we kind of gotten a little bit back into plants and soil and such, but... And that's 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 the problem that you face when you started this podcast with me. Yes, yes, yes it is. But just keep drinking whiskey and follow me. We're going to talk about genetic engineering for humans, which, oh boy, that's a whole can of worms, not the kind you dump on soil on Mars. Nice. <laughs> if i can't get puns in i'll get i'll get the dumb jokes in bioengineering humans is possible it's possible to do this for mars and venus um but should we does it mean making our planet mul- multiple planet species would that just simply create a new branch a new split in the evolution chain i this hurts this is it's it's if we can but should we nick that's that's my question to you before we get into this. We can create humans, but should we? Yeah. Okay. So I think I'm going to maybe explain a little bit more for the audience. So like we said, humans and plants, everything that lives on this planet has adapted to live here for thousands, millions of years, depending on the lineage. When we start going to Mars, and if we don't start coming back, those humans will look very different from the humans who live on Earth. Could they even be called humans at that point? It's it's like a new species. Like, instead of Homo sapien, uh, it'd be Terra Homo sapiens and Martian Homo sapiens. Like, right? At that point? Exactly. So, it it would be, I think at first, you'd have your geographic isolation. So, uh, not to bring it back to Ponderosa Pine in trees, but so there's a... Or, sorry, Douglas fir. You have a coastal Douglas fir and an inland Douglas fir. And they're technically the same species, but they're a different variety. So I think that's what it would start out as. You'd have human, earth humans, and Martian humans. And they would have they would have the same basic genetics, but they'd have different phenotypes. But as time goes on, then it'd morph into different pheno- genotypes. 
as different genes were selected through selective breeding and who can and cannot survive in this environment, you'd start to express human each quote unquote species would start to express itself in different ways. You wouldn't need the the muscle structure on Mars that you had on Earth. You wouldn't need your lungs might be different. Everything might be different about you. You'd all we'd all have a common ancestor still, but we wouldn't be able to visit each other's planets. To me, it's almost like dog. You can say dog, but there's poodles, there's pugs, there's Rottweilers, there's boxers. They're all dogs, but they're all different niches, different roles, different abilities, different environments, and that could be the way humans turn out if we turn into a multi-planet or multi-celestial beings. We, with lesser gravity, we don't need as much muscle mass or bone density, so we'll elongate. We'll become thinner and longer because we don't need to use so much force. And if we visit a planet that has higher density and we live there for generations upon generations, we'll probably become shorter, stockier, and wider to like more like an elephant to help support our weight. It's, I don't, I don't know if we can classify those as humans anymore it's its own species right at what point does like homo erectus and homo like say like when do our ancestors split and become us like when it's it's a very delicate fine line is it uh is it when one exterminates the other it might be to that point because i'm also thinking if we wanted a shortcut because us humans we do love our shortcuts decide to start genetic engineering I don't know, humans to be more sulfur resistant so if, when we go to Venus, that's going to change your DNA. That's li- it is literally changing your DNA. It's going to affect you differently. You're going to grow differently. You're going to breed differently. Your offspring's going to be different. And if we keep doing that enough cycles, is it even human anymore? Like if you have a hammer and the handle breaks, you put a new handle on it, it's still the same hammer. But now the head cracks and you put a new hammer, a new head on the hammer, is it still the same, is it still the original hammer? Simply replacing all the parts on your car to to keep it operating but is it still the same old car i i don't know i'm very i guess torn against this i actually if i had to make a point i would say i'm against human genetic engineering to live on celestial bodies simply because i think that would create too much drift in our species amongst each other and we should be looking towards helping each other rather than creating new species for each individual planet does that make sense it does. I think you're wrong, but it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think I'm wrong? Because humans have and will continue to adapt to any niche co- nature places I'm into. So whether we shorten the process with genetic engineering or we just naturally drift apart, humans are going to go into places that they shouldn't. Humans are going to continue to thrive in places that they should not. They're going to live in places that they should be dead in because... The only thing that humans fear more than the environment is other humans. We'd rather live in Alaska, Russia, Siberia, all these shitty places rather than live with other humans. And we are going to live on Mars no matter what. What if it makes it so those people who want to live on Mars don't die as often? Because not everyone can just live on Mars. There's probably genetics that you need that maybe we don't know right now, but we'll have an idea later on. I think genetic engineering is probably the way that we're going to keep those people alive. And I don't know if it's that much different than giving, uh, you know, people flintlocks and black powder pistols to go settle the West. I mean, they had a huge technological advantage, but and maybe they did do bad things and did good, did good things. But I don't know, man, it's like we have the technology. Why not? uh, You know, if we're going to do it, do it right, you know? Go big or go home. For me, history has shown don't fuck with Mother Nature. And time and time again, history has also, to me, shown just because we can doesn't mean we should. Now, if it's a set of astronauts who want to go to a different planet and want to get genetically engineered, fine. I'm okay with that with some conditions. Probably no breeding. I think that's an ethics question where you're changing your genome sequence away from nature naturally and the offspring and the following offspring and down the line will have no say with that now we developed our traits like you said nick because us humans we don't like living with next to other humans so if we develop them naturally i'm okay with it more than tweaking with our dna now granted i don't want to see humans on europa be 
longer and thinner and look nothing human alike. I think we should try to stay together as a species, as a family. Will that happen? Probably not. I'm probably a fool for hoping and believing in this. But I think if we lose our identity and start splitting off into different identities, we lose what makes us human. Us resilient little cockroaches that we are, we're still human. And I don't know if a Martian, a, a person who eventually becomes a Martian because their genome line lived there, so they adapted more to the radiation, the cold temperature, the blue sun. No, yeah, blue sun. They have a blue sun on Mars. Uh, they adapted to that. Are they even, I don't think you can call them human anymore. They're their own species. And it seems like a shame because now, now I'm trying to imagine traveling and trading between our two species. It'd be more isolationism on a larger scale. It would be Mars versus Earth, Venus versus Mars. It wouldn't be a collected species where we could travel planet to planet. But if we try to make it so if you're on Mars, you have to do all these workouts or take this pill to help you not lose bone density or muscle mass. So that way you could return to Earth so that way we can keep going back and forth. I, I'd be okay with that. Or maybe this is just me just throwing it out there. Maybe make Mars like a work planet where kids aren't and pregnant women and People with underlying diseases aren't allowed to go to Mars. You can go there to work, do experiments, et cetera, et cetera, much like Antarctica, because, and then you can return to Earth. So that way you're a full-grown adult, you're used to Earth's gravity, then you're allowed to go out into space, like being like 18 and join the military sort of steal. I've been kind of rambling on out there, but I don't know. It still seems inherently wrong to change humans so far for what we think is human nowadays. Now, granted, in a thousand years, what we think of humans could be completely different. We are constantly adapting, but to force that onto other humans or other humans to volunteer to mod themselves so foreign, so alien-like, it doesn't seem right. It seems something that needs to be very considered and very thought through. I don't know. I think, uh, you know, if explorers have always put themselves in situations that no one else has been in, I mean... Polynesians to get to Hawaii had to cross thousands of miles of open water in a kayak or canoe or whatever the fuck you want to call it to get there. A lot of people consider that unnatural. Now, granted, they're not varying their genetic material. Their DNA remained the same. But there's a lot of unknowns in settling a new place. And granted, we may say, well, maybe it's unnatural to change our genetics to survive in a Martian atmosphere. What happens if we go to Mars? We figure out we actually can't live here unless we change our genetics to allow us to eat these toxic materials that are in the soil. We can't go to Mars unless we allow our bodies to absorb this much radiation that would normally cause a normal human cancer. Now at this point, I'm sure by the time in human history, we've developed something that will stop radiation on Earth. I, not total, but just for our skin. Everyone will be genetically modified to have skin that bounces off enough UV rays to protect us from the amount of cancer or amount of UV radiation that will then cause us cancer to get. I think we don't know enough about what technology is going to do, but I'll tell you what, Mike, if they said, hey, you can go to Mars, but we're going to change your genetics so that you're more readily able to live with the effects of radiation poisoning, yeah, I'd do it. Maybe I'd die early, but <laughs> fuck, I'd do that. I don't know if I would. Being... Me is literally my DNA, and taking away part of my DNA takes away part of from me. It takes part of my soul away. It changes who I am. I don't care if it, they say it's just going to help you your skin become more protective to radiation. There are chain reactions to other effects that we won't know. Now, I'd be okay with supplementing where it's not so, I guess, minor modifications. So it's not completely changing us to live on the planet but simply to protect us from the planet so like i mentioned bone density muscle mass maybe maybe radioactive protective skin but i don't know when you start changing so maybe your skin turns red to match the mars color scheme maybe because it's more protective for that atmosphere and stuff like that and now your body just naturally adapts to be longer and skinnier because of no gravity and maybe your body can eat food grown on Mars, but you can't eat anything from Earth. That that seems like you're not human anymore. That's that's why I, I kind of happy I came up with the idea of you have to be a full-grown adult before you're allowed to travel to another planet and not have families or birth or be, or underlying diseases when you're on another celestial body. Uh, well, can What's your opinion on that, Nick, before we press forward? I think that's a, a good starting out point. I mean, if we want to 
truly become an interplanet species, we will have to reproduce in another planet at some time or another. Maybe, but hopefully by then we'll have tech where we don't have to completely change who we are to do so. But everything we do changes who we are. Genetics is... Any little thing can change your genetics. I mean, from not your genetics, but change the genetics of a population. For example, if we... No, I agree I agree with that. It's just... It's just natural versus synthetic is, I yeah, think, but a debate argument. If we have a population living on Mars, growing on a certain protein or uh, certain plants, not the wide range of plants that we eat currently in, in Earth, people who are whose bodies are naturally accustomed to that diet, they will become the dominant genes of that population. And before you know it, that small population will have very different genetics. It's called a bottleneck effect. We talked about it a few other podcasts, but as soon as you separate, oh, fuck, as soon as you separate the a large population and turn it into a small population, that small population's genetics will greatly differ from the original population. So whether we do it ourselves or let it happen. I guarantee you the genetics of the first couple hundred people on Mars will be vastly different from the genetics of the next generation of people on Earth. No, you're, I mean, you're probably right, but it doesn't mean you have to like it. You don't always get what you want. <laughs> well, speaking of not always getting what you want, we should probably talk about the politics of living on another planet. Well, I think before we get into the politics, we should talk about where all the resources come in outer space. So, obviously... Earth is going to be the major producer of food and technology for a while. But as we move into space, the easiest place to get raw materials is going to be the asteroid belt. Which we talked about in another podcast. We should definitely go check out at Backyard Philosophy and on Spotify and Backyard Philosophy on YouTube. So the asteroid belt is, with that, with mining, that's where we're going to get most of our raw materials. Now, a lot of the technology in the beginning of human expansion into space is going to come from Earth. But once humans start to establish themselves in outer space, the asteroid belt will be the producer of materials for at least Mars and the belt. And Mars will then become their biggest commodity will be ideas, their patents, the technology. So so hang on there. I want to say, before we continue, the asteroid belt is mainly metal made up of metals but there's a lot of class a b and c and there's not a lot of other materials than metals on them so keep that in mind as we're talking about this conversation because we we talked about resources like needing phosphorus on the surface mars for farming these are more like um gold more uh iron more uh platinum different those kind of materials so sorry i didn't interrupt you there no you're good it's uh it, it is crazy that the more we expand, it's almost like the more we we need each other because we can't do it alone. You can't have a solely, at least for a while, an independent Mars colony. You can't have an independent belt colony. They each produce goods in their own right, but you need partners to trade. You need partners to survive. Yes. It kind of seems like uh, going back to Expanse a little bit with the belt, Mars, and Earth. <laughs> Everyone fighting for resources and everyone kind of trading. Yeah. And uh, each, uh, what would you call it, government, territory, area, is going to have its own resources. So when the United States or North America was settled, the big resource was furs and timber. When space will be settled, the big resource will be metals from the belt and fertilizer. You know, the moon has surprisingly little resources. Um, it's not rich in carbon or nitrogen or hydrogen, and uh, the oxygen on the moon requires a lot of energy to remove, so it's not really a huge benefit. But for the most part, I think the major players, and this is more your territory, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but probably be, much like the Expanse predicted, be humans on Mars, humans in the belt, and humans on Earth. Yes, and I, I still think Venus is a huge one because it's very similar to our gravity, which is a huge po a component to me. And also, hitting up a planet, it, it's... It's easier to get things, slow things down than it is to get things going. So cool it, cool it down is a lot easier than heating things up. But before I get to, like, we talk about territory and stuff like that, since you mentioned it, Nick, Europa. I've been wanting to talk to you about Europa, and I keep mentioning it throughout the podcast, because th this how is this not a sci-fi horror movie? I have no idea. So, Europa. It's an ice moon of Jupiter. Kind of small, 
only like 14% gravity compared to Earth. But underneath the ice may be an entire vast ocean. Vast ocean of what liquid? We don't quite know. But I can see us humans digging into the ice and making an underwater, under ice water base on another planet. Because we have no, because ice has a really unique feature of being a th- uh, thermal insulator. So when it freezes, it flows to the top. That's why fish don't die when winter fr- uh, freezes over a lake. So if there's life, could be possible underneath the ice on Europa. So we could dig a base. The same dr- the same drones and robots and machinery that we mine on Earth. We should talk about mining for asteroids. The same we could use for Mars, for Venus, and for Europa. Now, Europa is also very interesting to me because we don't have to worry about water, like, at all. Nick mentioned with hydro farming and uh, it using lots of water, it's not a problem on Europa. The entire surface of Europa is ice. The harder part would be getting soil. Well, that seems a lot easier to do than transporting water, because water and gravity tends to get everywhere, tends to float, tends to impact. So I can see it being almost early days, everyone helps each other, but then there's going to be a split. Like, how can someone on a different planet tell us how we can live? How can someone on a different moon tell how a person lives on a planet? How can a planet tell how a moon people are supposed to live? I think this is a eventually going to reach us a different horizon. Sorry. I just, I just picture a sci-fi movie of people digging underneath the ice in Europa, setting up an underwater base, and there's all these alien creatures underneath the water, and I just feel like that should be a movie somehow or some way. Yeah, it more reminds me of like an old Star Wars video game, Knights of the Republic, but yeah, it's definitely a definitely a concern. See, I was I was thinking like the thing, like the Antarctica trip. Fun uh this is kind of interesting and it kind of ties in together. So, there's a competition currently that no one's completed yet. There's a bottom of the lake in Antarctica that they discovered that's been completely untouched, unisolated, but they don't want to keep bear- digging to it because they don't want to contaminate the water. So, they're trying to figure out how to grab a sample of water without contaminating the rest of the water with it or containing the sup, uh, the sample. I imagine that same technology, if we ever figure out how to do it, would be used for Europa as well. Just wanted to throw that out there. Probably. So, fun fact, um, everyone's probably, that's not true. A lot of people probably saw something about how organic material is discovered on Mars and people point to that a lot in the soils. And NASA isn't entirely certain whether that organic material they found on Mars was just remnants of some organic material that someone touched the uh, the collection on Earth. Yes, you mentioned this. Yeah, so it doesn't take a lot. I mean, literally just a fingerprint can leave that material on that object and, uh, and that's contaminated. So it's, it's harder than it it would appear to remove organic matter from whatever you're doing. Yes, very hard. But sorry that I kind of went off the rails with Europa. I just, I want this to be a sci-fi horror movie so badly. I just to keep mentioning it. But back to the politics of it. So let's fast forward a little bit. We've got some colonies on Mars, Venus, and Europa. Now they're kind of being more self-sufficient. We don't have to send them as many resources as more communication. Say, hey, how you doing? And it's pretty good sample size of people in each one. I imagine the laws and the rules will quickly to change. The same captain who was the commander and the the commanding officer of whatever colony he was at will die, and the new one will come over. When with power comes corruption, and then eventually we could see a space war or or just even dividing up a planet currently with our laws there no one can lay himself and claim to any planet or moon but you know us humans we're not exactly the best at keeping treaties or following laws so i imagine once we figure out how to get to other planets quite quickly and somewhat set up base there i imagine those laws and rules are going to go out the door do you concur nick no taxation without representation mike well, if Russia gets there first, then it doesn't matter. Or if China gets us first, it doesn't matter. Or the European Union doesn't get get there first. We could be at another land grab to carve up the solar system of different planets, different parts. People fighting over the poles of Mars. People fighting over volcanoes in Venus. It's a real possibility. And one, I would say, within a thousand years of our time. No, that that's very true. And I, I want to point back to... Uh... I read a lot of things, and I read a lot of people's different ideas on colonizing space and all that. And 
holy shit, does history repeat itself. Now, we all know the value of, of land here on Earth. In the United States, you can actually measure it through a monetary value if you go on Zillow. <laughs> but Russia sold Alaska to the U.S. for like a cent an acre or something less than that. What do we get? Um, a penny per every seven acres Louisiana purchase or something like that. The United States bought a lot of land for really cheap. And I still see idiots, people who you would think is smarter than me, have some big degree and shit, saying, oh, land on Mars or land on the moon will be worth nothing. Don't invest in it. Don't try and buy any land. What if Russia still owned Alaska? Do you know how much they could sell that to the U.S. for today? Do you know how much it's worth? And just mineral, just the gasoline that's there? People are so fucking stupid, Mike. Like, uh, we have seen the folly of France and Russia and selling vast amounts of land for nothing. It never works out. Who, who's, well, France had to sell because, yeah, they needed money to pay for their wars. But in the long term as a country, it might have benefited them more to keep that land, which this is getting way off topic, but... Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred, hundred percent. But to, but to add on to what you're saying, the people saying don't buy land because it's stupid. I'm hoping, even though I'm completely wrong, humans are just stupid. We're a dumb species. I'm hoping they're trying to say that because buying land now, technically, even if you got a certificate saying you bought land on Mars, like a square acres of Mars, it's there's no legal binding. Technically, you didn't buy anything. You literally just gave money away for a certificate, and that certificate means nothing because right now, no country can lean sovereign claim to another planet or territory in in space yes that is true due to the oh my gosh it's it's the international space treaty or something anyway even though the u.s put her flag on the moon first all right land race going back to land race nick yeah so my my whole point is i read all about you know the, the kind of the politics of this and man a lot of people are saying oh you're there's no use buying land. Land is the only thing we cannot create more of. Well, matter can't be created or destroyed, but we could clump together asteroids together and make our own planet. But then we need to put it in the Goldilocks zone. Sorry, I, I got off the scientific trail there. But no, you are right. Land is so valuable. You got to have somewhere to lay your head. And you can't always just float around in space forever. It's so far not really good for humans to constantly keep doing that. We're going to need land. We're going to need resources, and not all the resources we can find are in asteroids that are mineable in a rotational mobile space station. We need to set our foot on the ground and build a homestead. Yeah, for sure, and it's just amazing to me after, I think we can agree that people get varying degrees of history depending on where they go to school. I think everyone learned about the Louisiana Purchase and Maybe half of those people learned about how we sold, how Alaska was sold and how the United States bought every other territory. We really, the United States, by we, really made out like fucking bandits. <laughs> yeah. You mean everything left of the Mississippi is, is just ours now? Okay, sure. And to just to, from the historical aspect of saying, oh, fuck, those guys made a fucking killing... And then to turn around and be like, well, you know, I went to fucking Harvard and whatever the fuck, and I did all this schooling, but like, I wouldn't invest in land because blah, blah, blah. It's like, are you... F- <laughs> yeah, we'll have outposts and asteroids, and we'll have space stations, but... Nick, don't tell them this so we can buy more land for ourselves. <laughs> That's true. You're right. You fucking idiots are geniuses. <laughs> no, it, 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 it was wild to me because I don't... As a... As a quote-unquote layman myself, I was like, "What are they seeing something I'm not seeing? And uh, I think they're just seeing something I'm not seeing is the value of land. And at one point, even on Mars, that land will be able to produce agriculture and crops, and you can sell it for that. But just think about if you uh, invested in uh, a homestead in Denver 100 years ago, how rich you'd be right now. Or, dare I say... California, Los Angeles, or San Diego. Oh, God. We're always somehow bringing it back to shitting on California. But you'd be fucking rich. Oh, my God. Just imagine all the gold in South North Dakota, all those minerals and resources. But since since those, I think you said there was Harvard people, didn't exactly know what they're talking about, maybe, maybe they're going crazy, which is a possibility living in space psychology 
The psychology of living in space, Nick, it's a real study. It's a it's a real pursuit for psychologists, which was very, very interesting to to choose. Like just alone, the people they choose to be astronauts, like they'll pick ten astronauts to train out of like sixty people of a final list who are the most like Well, they'll pick ten older children. Yeah. Ten only children or older children. Don't forget the only child, Nick. <laughs> but it's so interesting, the psychology of space, because I imagine the psychology of space has to be very similar to the early days of international ships, like being sailors and pirates, of not sure if you're going to run out of resources, uh, maybe not seeing land for days, or maybe not even seeing land, rogue storms, just all these things, being confined with the same people day in, day out for months, if not years on end, wanting to strangle the person next to you, even though you can't go anywhere. That's... Yeah, going to be happening in space they've talked about when um so mar transferring to mars used to be an estimated two years to do we've shortened that distance from now but when we were doing the experimentation of sending people for a long distance to mars nasa astronauts were building or not building they were designing entire separate little hubs so the people that are transferring together could be separated for a little while so they could have their own alone time imagine never having alone time constantly being in radios with people back on earth and every, like no privacy whatsoever like your shower i don't know if you've ever seen a shower on the international space station nick but you should look it up it is so sad and i am i do like my showers i'll say it and i'll say it proudly so that'd be a little sad but i can get over with but hey people can go stir crazy people imagine imagine standing out on mars surface in your spacesuit and seeing nothing but a red desert and you don't think people have gone crazy going in the Sahara Desert and seeing nothing but nothing but sand go on for miles, 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 not seeing any green, any trees, any other human. Like the psychology of space is a whole new field that I hope enters into the education system. Oh, for sure. And you don't know it, but you did in fact describe uh, what it's like to live in a fraternity in college of not having privacy even in the shower and everyone seeing you naked and that's pretty much it but you could but nick you could go outside for a hike you go somewhere else for a little bit for your own little alone time you can't do yeah, that in mars not not yeah you could i mean you could but you die you like the you like the people and they were there with you all the time which this is part of the this is part of the psychology that attracts and repels me from space so like we talked about in the bs episode my favorite time period would be settling the West and the openness and the just lack of regulation and do whatever you want, make your own destiny, settle the new frontier. The only commonality Mars or space has with that is a new frontier. There'd be lots of regulation, teamwork. It's it's you and everyone there versus nature. It's It's completely different. And we talked about this a little off air previously of... I work in a lot of teams and I work best in teams when I don't have to tell someone that they need to get something done. I like all of us to be on the same page of you get your job done and that's, well, you just, you just get your job done. It's not a fucking question. So NASA pre-screens all their astronauts to make sure that they don't have any people who would not get that done, that everyone is very mission focused. And not only that, but they can interact well with the other people on their crew yeah but now we're talking larger scale of being a multi-planet species it's there's gonna be a lot that fall through the cracks where that's not true you're gonna have some asshole eat more tomatoes than everyone else you're gonna have someone drink more water than someone else and you can't really exactly throw them on space prison so no but you can kill them that's what i was thinking do you just do you have your own that brings it back to politics with the psychology if someone's getting on your stir crazy and they're immensely affecting you, can you give them a fair trial on another planet? Would it be a virtual court that's like 14 minute delay? Or would you just shove them out into the outside where they would freeze to death and be kind of cooked? Mike is sus. <laughs> I have, I'm just going to go down this vent for a little bit and then <laughs> don't worry about me. Yeah, no, but that's, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good point because, yeah, we don't really know. I mean... We can infer there's a lot of studies. NASA has humans live together in cramped places for a long time all over the United States. Well, all over the world. Just just measuring the how their 
personalities react. And this is about the only time I'm really interested in, uh, what you call it, like uh, personality kind of psychology, shit like that, like when it affects other people. Um, I did run into a pretty interesting podcast, Mike, if, if you want to check it out or else wants to check it out. It's called How Do We Prevent Suicide on an Extraplanetary Space Colony? I love the name of it. Definitely writing that one down. But it was pretty interesting. It's from an actual psychologist, and he, he did talk about um, just the what causes suicide on Earth and how it's more com- it would be more common in space and interesting things that would tire humans out. Like we talked about, you know... It, thing about space travel is everything is so fucking connected it's it's very much like talking about uh the environment the forest morale really will make or break anything and in space they call it in on earth too they call it food fatigue for say the military when you give soldiers meal after meal that's the same every day they lose morale they don't care which is why if we were going on a purely operational basis the only food grown in space would be algae you can eat 100% of the plant you grow, but you need to vary it up to keep morale up in space. So that's why you come in with lettuce and hot sauce, carrots, hot sauce, all this kind of shit. <laughs> but it all ties in together. It is space is, uh, you know, I, I used to think uh, on Earth, nature and forest was, uh, you know, multi, uh, not dimensional, um, like uh, topic, multi topic or whatever the fuck it is. There are layers to it. There's a lot of factors that go into it, from soil science, microbe science, plant science, from at the atmosphere, weather, climate, just a lot of shit that goes into it. But it almost seems like space is more connected because of the lack of life out there. On Earth, everything is connected because of the huge amount of life that connects everything. But it's almost in space, everything is more connected because if it's not there, if there's not microbes in the soil, dead. If there's not plants cleaning the atmosphere, dead. It's because you don't have the luxury. So if you're growing, if you're a corn farmer in the Midwest and all your corn dies because of aphids or whatever the fuck, you got crop insurance. If you're on Mars and you're relying on your crops to not only give you sustenance but clean your air, you're just dead. It doesn't matter how much fucking insurance you have. You're just fucking dead. <laughs> higher risk, higher reward. But the... Boys in London will definitely be happy to collect that insurance. <laughs> but I'd be curious, Nick. We should try that. It's definitely one day we should try to put hot sauce on allergy and see how that tastes. Probably like shit. <laughs> one way to find out. <laughs> shit with hot sauce on it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I can almost tell you exactly what hot algae tastes like. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we could genetically engineer different types of algae to taste differently we could have bacon tasting algae or steak tasting algae or i i can see i can see a theme which i'm going for here already meat tasting is algae. this just like algae that tastes yep. like meat <laughs> there's a huge so what you're saying is you like meat i i yes nick i am a omnivore so i do i do like meat i got another uh quick question to run by you which is something that you kind of touched on it in the uh, Mountain Man episode when you're like, well, how would you figure it out? It's like, oh, fucking compass. Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. Okay. You can't navigate with a compass. Now, I don't, this probably doesn't affect the average American, but to me, to not have a north, south, east, west would be fucking debilitating. Why not? You, you could just use a gyroscope. You could, but that's, you have to learn a completely new skill. No, well, we could simplify it for you, Nick. We could, we could transfer the the gyroscope would either be 2pi or, or not 2pi wow 2ic or spi and we can turn that into a digital screen that act, looks like a compass so it'll, it'll look and act like a compass for you but it's just different hardware that's good because my brother who wouldn't know north south east west from his ass would really make fun of me if we got to a place where there was no north south east west <laughs> and i was like which way was north and he'd be like oh are you a fucking idiot <laughs> <laughs> Nick, I can I can see you like like looking at your compass in a spacesuit and like poking the glass. Like, why isn't this working? I was like, oh, there must be a bunch of iron here that's fucking up the fucking magnetism. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you could always navigate by the sun and stars. But the, 
Isn't the sun it's, go around twice? Or not the sun, no. Uh, the One of the moons of Mars goes around twice, so you can use that, right? Yes. Uh, I think, what is there... I can't forget. I can't remember how many. Uh, I cannot remember which one it is, so don't ask me. Uh, I was gonna say how many moons there are on Mars. And I can't remember. I think it's like four or five. Can't quite remember. No, but I mean, to me, the one thing I at uh, one I just thought about this now. How beautiful would the stars be on Mars with no light pollution? I mean, no light pollution. Two, I still love how the blue planet Earth has a red sun. And the red planet Mars has a blue sun just because of atmosphere and, show, and shedding the light through. So you would see a, you could, maybe in the future, you could see a blue sunrise and a red sunset. Yeah. I mean, that was uh, in college and spring break. I woke up, saw the sunrise in Florida and flew back to Seattle, saw the sunset and the uh, Pacific. And uh, But the, the point of that story is more, this is more closer to Star Wars of i needed to bring this up martian sand is is not good for machines and it's coarse and it's gritty and it gets everywhere and sharp yep it's like you said full of iron that those molecules are pointy yeah so that that's a big problem for living on mars but we need to find a planet with two suns and then we need to i will be a moisture farmer on that planet shoot mole rats from because of your with my t16 you fucking bet (laughs) (laughs) well i can't help you with the two suns but i can maybe help you with the grittiness again venus seems a more viable option than mars to me closer in gravity warmer it's don't get me wrong it's got its downsides but it seems less hurdles now Nick, I'm not quite sure what else you have to go else to go, but since we're back on Mars and the the soil of Mars, I I did forget one topic point which I thought was kind of the best of both being on the surface of Mars and underneath Mars. I can't quite remember who came up with the idea, but pretty much is drop a lot of bombs to create a crater and then build a sphere on top of the crater. So the Martians you'd be down in a canyon almost with a with a clear top. So you'd have protection on the sides, and any storms would happen and would just go over above you. But you still get natural sunlight and such like that, which I kind of like. I think that'd be very beautiful. But I'm imagining one little crack or one little leak, and you are screwed. Yeah, but at the same time, humans need sunlight. Maybe not in the same manner that plants do, but... Oh, just for psychology. Like we talked about... Yeah, like we talked about the uh, suicide in space... (laughs) morale is very important in space and there's i just i I don't know for sure and i didn't really run across this too much but i can imagine living underground for however long you would start to go crazy you you wouldn't resemble a human it would be it's not something we're used to i mean we need sunlight to you know it's a vitamin that our bodies can process well maybe we could get away with artificial sunlight because i mean a lot of people some people live in bunkers or in submarines for a very long time. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a timeline of how long we could go without sunlight, but I guess the question <laughs> Until we do the question <laughs> is what effect does that have on the morale of the population? <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. Out of curiosity, Nick, if you were a space pirate or astronaut, how would you commit suicide in space? Oh, I would uh, definitely walk out the space lock or the fucking airlock. I think I would try to take a pod and go to a different planet or the sun. I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert about what happens when you get to the sun. <laughs> oh, do I get a Capri Sun if I make it to the sun? Fuck, he cracked the code. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I got another question for you, Nick. And this might be a good question to ask the viewers or whoever's listening. You have been selected to be the first one of the first individuals to go to another planet or celestial body. Neil Armstrong said one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. What would you say on that first step onto Martian soil, that first step onto Venus, on that first step into Europa? What would your words be? I made it, bitches. <laughs> I was expecting like, Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> That'd be a good one. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a big good with my words guy. I'd probably just say, yeah, fuck, <laughs> fuck you guys. guys, I'm going home. <laughs> fuck you guys, I am now home. I don't know. I think 
perhaps I'm a little bit more dramatized, but I, I, I still need to think about that. But I'll be very curious, Nick, if you come up with a real one or if anyone's listening on our, and tells us on our Instagram or on YouTube or where anywhere you listen to us. I'd, I would love to hear some really good Neil Armstrong, for, uh, First Man on the Moon sentences. Just that, that historic moment. Does uh, fuck you, Jeff Bezos count? <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting you one with plant, Nick. Like, up. Oh, like, or like, uh, I forgot the kid at home or something. I do, in fact, have an actual good quote to end the episode with, Mike. Oh, boy. What is it? Every great migration in history happened because we took our agriculture with us. When you learn to take your plants with you, you can not only go to visit, you can go there to stay and live. Robert Furl. That's a good one. I quite enjoy that. Yeah. Well, about to wrap this bitch up. Uh, what are you listen? What are you reading right now, Mike? I am reading the fascinating book of thermoplastics and injection molding because I'm trying to do a crash course and figure out how to do that for myself. So probably wouldn't recommend for the average user listener, and I wouldn't recommend, but I kind of want to learn how to do it. So there's that. What about you, Nick? What are you reading? Uh, probably an equally interesting book to the listener. It's a book called Trilobites. It's about the history of trilobites. <laughs> We're such fucking nerds. <laughs> and I would not recommend it to literally anyone who likes reading or the English language because it is literally just a book about trilobites and it's not that interesting unless you are interested in trilobites. We're so fucking nerds. Oh. Oh, Nick. I, <laughs> also, you can find I'm us so on lost Instagram. without you. So. <laughs> All right, all right. Where can they, where can they find us, Nick? They can find us on Instagram. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to get. But you could. cannot find us on Twitter. <laughs> why can't you find us on Twitter? Because fuck Twitter. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> Our fucks level have gone so down, Nick. This is what happens oh. when you colonize a new planet. <laughs> like, we. We were talking about this earlier. When researching the politics of colonies, we're like, oh, we should look at countries that have a lot of colonies. Obviously, Europe. Like, well, maybe we should look at colonies that, or countries that actually kept their colonies. So maybe like Portugal. I think the only colony Europe peacefully surrendered was what, Canada? Did they peacefully surrender India? Mm, I don't think they sex. They, they, no, not India and not Canada. Anyway. Europe's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, this is a very in-depth, multiple-layered topic, much like an ogre with an onion. Well, yeah, it's got a lot of layers. Yeah, that's that's what I just that's what I just said. <laughs> um, I wanted to make sure you knew I got the Shrek <laughs> reference. Is what happened. <laughs> Space exploration, multi-planet species, is difficult, but it's not impossible. And every day, great men and women stride towards it and get closer and closer. And maybe, maybe in our lifetime, Nick, we'll be able to go to Mars. Probably in our children's lifetime. I would say most definitely in our grandchildren's time. But if you want to send two, two whiskey-drinking cowboys to Mars, me and Nick, we volunteer. Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and Backyard Philosophy Podcast on